Hello, everyone. Welcome to another webinar, number 88. As we wind down the summer, August 23rd, 2018. Very, very excited about our webinar uh, this evening. We are so very pleased that Dr. Theo Harides is joining us this evening to talk about uh, mast cells. I think it's safe to say that uh, he's probably one of the world experts on, if not the world expert on this uh, subject. And we're just honored that he's, uh, that he's here. Uh, these webinars are every two weeks. Our regular webinar will be in two weeks. I'm not sure when we have it scheduled, but we do have uh, Nathan Bryan, uh, the expert on nitric oxide, coming up very soon. And also uh, Dr. Ingrid Kolstadt uh, from uh, John Hopkins talking about her, her book. Uh, next week, we're going to have something very special, not an, an educational, but uh, Dr. Sharon Cohen-Hausman, a uh, functional medicine doctor in Texas, is making some genetic reports that are very specifically medically oriented. And for those of you who have license to uh, practice medicine, uh, you'll be able to uh, use her software. And uh, I know that's most of you on here, but <clears throat> we do have a couple herbalists and, and dietitians. But uh, it'll be a completely different approach to what uh, we look at with uh, pathways. Uh, of course, you all know about the online certification course. Uh, just go to dnasupplementation.com. There it is. I think you all know that uh, the software that analyzes is now called functional genomic analysis. And things are filling up very quickly. Uh, I think we have around 55 people registered, and we only have seats for 80. So uh, if you want to come out to join us in Hershey, uh, you better do so quickly. Uh, November 9 to 11, uh, myself, Emily Givler, Dr. Larry Young, uh, Beth O'Hare, naturopath, Carly Sink, aromatherapist, Morley Robbins, the magnesium man, Dr. Marcus Borges, Dr. Andrea Borges. And I think we're going to have one other speaker and that is uh, Robert Slovak, who's quite the expert in uh, water. He'll be talking about Quinton water, but we'll give you more information on that. So filling up very, very quickly. I'd hate for those of you who are faithful to our webinars to miss. Come to beautiful Hershey, November 9 to 11. Uh, at the DNA website, uh, there's a link where you can register online. Some exciting things, including a practitioner map that uh, we're going to be preparing we're probably right up to the last minute that's going to show you the epigenetic and genetic pathways and uh, <clears throat> dr young beth emily uh, morley myself matthew miller we're all going to uh, winston-salem this labor day weekend and we're going to uh, have a think tank master think tank uh, just from morning till night, we're going to try to draw out some of these pathways and make it in something printable for you. All right, I want to get right to our guest this evening. And again, so blessed that he has uh, joined us, uh, Dr. Theo Harides. Uh, he's a professor of pharmacology and internal medicine, as well as a director of molecular immuno immunopharmacology and drug discovery in the Department of Immunology at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. He was born in Greece and graduated with honors from Anatolia College. He received all his degrees with honors from Yale University and was awarded the Dean's Research Award and the Windsor Nitz Prize in Pathology. He trained in internal medicine at New England Medical Center, which awarded him the Oliver Smith Award, recognizing excellence, compassion, and service. He also received a certificate in global leadership from the Tufts Fletcher School of Law and diplomacy and a fellowship at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He has been serving as the clinical pharmacologist of the Massachusetts Drug Formulary Commission continually since 1986. In Greece, he served on the Supreme Advisory Health Council of the Ministries of Health and of Social Welfare, as well on the board of directors of the Institute of uh, Pharmaceutical Research and Technology. He chaired an international committee appointed by the Hellenic Ministries of Education and Health for Establishment of an Independent Medical School in Greece, and he's a member of the International Advisory Committee for the University of Cyprus School of Medicine. He is a member of 15 academies and scientific societies. He was inducted into the Alpha Omega 
Alpha National Medical Honor Society and the Rare Diseases Hall of Fame. He has received the Tufts Excellence in Teaching 10 times, the Tufts Distinguished Faculty Recognition Award twice, and their Alumni Award for Faculty Excellence. Boston Mayor's Community Award and the Dr. George uh, Papalozzi Award, as well as Honorary Director of Medicine from Athens University. Honorary Doctor of Sciences from Hellenic American University. And the 2018 Albert Nelson Lifetime Achievement Award and the 2018 Albert Nelson Distinguished Humanitarian Award. He is Archon or Archon of the Ecumenical uh, Patriarch of Constantinople. He first showed that mast cells known for causing allergic reactions are critical for inflammation, especially in the brain, and are involved in a number of inflammatory conditions that worsen by stress, such as allergies, asthma, eczema, psoriasis, migraines. MS, and most recently, autism spectrum disorder. He has also, so, it's also shown that the CRH hormone, neurotensin, and substance P peptides secreted under stress act together and with the cytokine AL33 to trigger mast cells to secrete inflammatory molecules. That's one of the things we're covering this evening, uh, some of the peptides and how they're involved. These processes are inhibited by the novel flavonoids, luteolin, that he helped formulate in unique dietary supplements and a skin lotion. He has published over 410 scientific papers and three textbooks with over 30,000 citations. He's in the top 5% of authors most cited in pharmacological and immunological journals. He's received 37 patents and trademarks, including three patents covering the use of luteolin in brain inflammation and autism. So I'm going to open up your uh, your microphone, and I will have you there in just uh, one second. There we are. Your microphone is on. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Well, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be with you. This was the longest uh, introduction I ever had. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wanted everyone to know the uh, the extent of your uh, contributions, and. Uh, we have this slide up where it says, I tend to think that the mast cell orchestrates uh, the inflammatory response. That has got to be uh, you know, a, a bold statement, uh, but, I, but I think you're going to make a very good argument tonight uh, why that is the case. And clearly, I think you'll be recognized as uh, one of the pioneers that made some major, major discoveries. Uh, we do want to talk about peptides, and uh, I just did a little reading up on my own, and now I can see why you're so excited about it. But just in case anyone on here is not totally up to mast cells, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, mast cell 101 here, we sure. see arresting activated. Sure, if you could absolutely. just comment on that, please. By the way, <clears throat> many thanks for putting up the first slide. Um, we actually use the term um, uh, mast cell as a mast cell regulator. Uh, almost 25 years ago. Uh, no one paid attention to that. But if you now look at some recent reviews on mast cells, uh, there's more and more discussion about the mast cell being a regulator rather than just um, being the bad guy in allergy. So it will be quite fascinating to see how the field develops in the next few years. Uh, now, uh, point number one, the mast cells have actually uh, survived for almost 500 million years. It's quite amazing that even jellyfish have mast cells and no one knows what they do. And of course, jellyfish don't get allergic reactions. They induce allergic reactions to many of us. Um, so we, at least I believe that the mast cell has existed for so many years because it literally contains pretty much every uh, uh, hormone, sort of neuropeptide, as well as inflammatory molecule found uh, so far. And in species where the various organs uh, or systems have not actually been developed yet, such as hormonal immune nervous system, the muscle probably acted in all of those capacities. Uh, and that eventually when systems were developed, uh, it became to be known fortunately or unfortunately, mostly about its involvement in allergies, but I think we will change that as we move forward. 
So the best known trigger of the mast cell is basically immunoglobulin E or IgE, discovered by the Ishizakas about 15 years ago or so. And it so happened that the IgE, even though it is in the smallest amount in the blood, homes and binds to specific receptors on the surface of mast cells, which are not circulating, and to basophils, who do circulate in the, in the blood. And they're very similar, but also very different. And the Ig sits there until such time as an antigen or allergen or some other substance that has the ability to bind and bridge two or more of these antibodies will in fact bridge them. And then it induces a series of reactions that lead to what we call degranulation. So think of a mast cell as a soccer ball filled with about 500 pink hole balls. Each pink hole ball being the secretory granules containing about you know, 20 or so mediators, including histamine, tryptase, chymase, heparin, chondroitin, sulfate, uh, which are released during this degranulation that you can imagine being like a hand grenade exploding. But that happens very rarely in cases of an anaphylactic reaction or a very severe allergic reaction. As it turns out, most of the time, the mast cells do not degranulate, and we will go actually into that a little later. But even when they degranulate and they release molecules such as histamine, of which we know a lot and we will talk about that, they also release Enzymes, which are not listed on this slide, such as tryptase and kinase, that we have no idea what they do, even though we use tryptase as an index of mast cell degranulation. Of course, they release many cytokines. Uh, we recently published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science showing that mast cells release interleukin-33, to which, of course, they also respond, as we will talk about later. And of course, they release lipid mediators such as leukotrienes and prostaglandins. But at the end of the day, the only thing we as physicians have so far, unfortunately, to address the mast cells would be their antihistamines of the type 1, such as Benadryl, or the type 2, such as Zantac, or aspirin, or such non steroidal anti inflammatory agents that might block prostaglandins which should not be used in patients that might be sensitive uh, to those molecules, especially in asthma, or leukotrienes, such as Singular. And towards the end, I will give you some uh, tips, at least, how I combine such molecules in addition to others. Um, let's move on to the next one, maybe slide. Sure. Um, now, let's talk about this a little bit. There is the very severe case, and can you tell us about this? Right. <clears throat> So first of all, the word mast cell is very confusing. It was used for the first time by Paul Ehrlich in his doctoral thesis in 1887, when he stained various tissues using a dye called <clears throat> toluidin blue. And the blue turned to violet, and he called that from the Greek metachromasia, change in color. So he noticed those numerous secretory granules, but he did not know what they did. And because he thought that those granules were feeding neighboring cells, and because the breast feeds the babies, he used the Greek word mastos, which means breast, for instance, mastectomy, as you know. Um, and he called it mast cells, which are probably as far as from the truth as they can be. But the word stuck. So in certain rare cases, if you have too many mast cells, we term that mastocytosis. It is a rare disorder, but unfortunately, most colleagues have stuck with the definition of mastocytosis by what we see in a bone marrow biopsy, or you see clusters or islands of mast cells, and many times their shape is spindle rather than oval or round. And correctly, it is stated on the slide that you have cutaneous mastocytosis, Sometimes we call it urticaria pigmentosa. You can have systemic mastocytosis. 90% of the people have indolent, uh, meaning they can have normal lifespan, although they have miserable symptoms. And then you can have mast cell leukemia, which is not listed in the slide, or mast cell sarcoma. 
However, we have cases where we literally have mastocytosis in the bladder, and we call that interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome. Uh, even though the United States, the number of mast cells in the mucosa or the detrusal muscle are not included in the diagnosis, in Europe it is a mandatory uh, criterion uh, for diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. And we're finding more and more that there might be localized mastocytosis in other tissues, but so far that is not classified as mastocytosis. And again, we can return to this because these terminologies are very, very confusing. Now, in mastocytosis, as I said, most of the patients would have indolent systemic mastocytosis. And in the bone marrow biopsy, we look actually for mutations of one particular receptor called CKIT receptor or CD117, that's a tyrosine kinase. And if it is mutated, we call that a gain of function mutation. So the mast cells basically are self-activated to proliferate. However, whether you have cutaneous mastocytosis that doesn't have that many symptoms, or systemic mastocytosis that has a lot of symptoms, or the muscles are activated by other reasons for a diagnosis that we will talk about shortly, at the end of the day, it is what triggers the mast cells and what they release that make our patients miserable and not necessarily the burden of the load of the mast cells, which becomes very significant in terms of prognosis and treatment only in aggressive systemic mastocytosis or leukemia, which is even rarer than mastocytosis as such. Next slide, please. Maybe. Now, a few years ago, some colleagues, primarily uh, Jen Aiken from uh, Michigan and Peter Valen from Austria, came up with a diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. Now, to me, that was very exciting at the time. And unfortunately, uh, over the last few months, and I'll say a little more about that, has, has come back to haunt me. Uh, I was very excited for two reasons. One, because the definition of mast cell activation syndrome, for the first time, included neurologic complaints. And my goodness, every single paper uh, <clears throat> that has been written in the last couple of years, especially by a French group called, uh, headed by uh, Dr. Mira, has reported severe symptoms of neuropsychiatric nature in these patients. And I'm not surprised, and it was music to my ears, because 25 years ago, we were among the first to publish that in the hypothalamus, and the median eminence that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary, we have as many mast cells as we have in the skin or the lungs, yet until recently we had no idea what those brain mast cells were doing. So I was excited because it connected at least neurologic complaints. And I was excited because for the first time they were paying attention to the activation, uh, whatever that, that really means. In my mind it means uh, secretion of various mediators. However, the criteria for this condition, which is much, much more common uh, than mastocytosis, included four, and unfortunately recently they've been reduced to three, and I'll indicate how that complicates things. So the criteria were number one, that you have telltale signs of uh, symptoms due to mast cell mediators. It could be flushing, hypotension, itching, you know, headaches, sometimes diarrhea. So far, so good. Criteria number two, that if you were to be given or administered uh, the known medications that address some of the mediators, such as antihistamines and antileukotriene, maybe uh, aspirin, you do get some benefit. The third criterion, which is uh, still in, in place, along with the first two that I mentioned, was high levels of the mast cell mediator tryptase during an episode. Now, that drives me crazy because if a patient were to have an episode at home, at, home at, at work, who on earth is going to draw blood and send it for a tryptase measurement, which is only done by a few labs in the United States? Uh, so that literally that excluded 
most of the patients who otherwise fit the uh, description of mast cell activation. The third criterion that was present until recently was levels in 24-hour urine of broken down products of either histamine, in other words, methyl histamine or methylmidazole acetic acid, abbreviated MIA, or the breakdown product of prostaglandin D2, which is 17 beta prostaglandin F2 alpha. Now, a tricky part about the 24-hour urine is number one, that it has to be collected and saved at four degrees centigrade or cold, and it has to be sent to the lab cold. And there aren't that many labs uh, that do these measurements. Uh, the best lab probably is Mayo Clinic, and I have a site specifically dedicated to this. Now, for some reason, 15 or so colleagues, uh, I was not included, uh, wrote a letter to the editor that was just accepted and now appears in press to the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, where they're addressing the worry, which is a bona fide worry, that way too many patients are showing up now with presumed um, diagnosis of mast cell activation uh, syndrome. And therefore, they dropped the last criterion of measuring uh, urine uh, mediators, and they're emphasizing uh, the tryptase levels. And either because of this or because of the confusion among many colleagues, the National Institute of Health uh, is holding a one-day uh, workshop on September 7th, specifically on muscle activation syndrome, uh, where hopefully um, uh, we will try to figure out what on earth the criteria should actually be. I was a little surprised that these colleagues, many of who will be present at this workshop, decided to send a letter for publication that was accepted ahead of the symposium like putting the cart before the horse. Now, having said that, I also feel very strongly that triptase is actually the wrong molecule to be measured. Mm, interesting. Granted, triptase is very specific only for mast cells. However, what good does it do if it is not actually secreted in most cases of mast cell activation syndrome? In fact, as I said, very, very few people uh, either have it high or could actually have it measured. And because most of the triggers of the mast cells in most of the patients, specifically mast cell activation syndrome patients, do not cause degranulation, the retriptase will not be released. And at the end of the day, even if it were to be released, we have no idea what it does. We have no way how to block it. We, had, we don't have an anti-triptase. And finally, to make things even more complicated, even though towards the end I'll try to maybe clarify them a little bit, there is now a new disorder, if you wish, and it's called high tryptosemia. So at NIH, they discovered, they published about a year ago, that a lot of patients have borderline tryptase levels in the serum. What is borderline? It was decided that a cutoff should be about 14 nanograms per milliliter. So these patients have levels that hover at about 12. Now, why they decided to call this a disease when it's below the cutoff, and yet this cutoff does not fit into muscle activation is beyond me. So we have muscle activation where we want triptase to be elevated, but we don't call it anything if the level is about, let's say, 10. And then we have a new category now of quote unquote, high serum triptase, but it is not high, it's below the cutoff limit. Yet everybody now is talking about that, yet that condition as well. So I think, unfortunately, medicine is actually uh, confusing the issue much more than clarifying it, especially as it relates to mast cells. Now, either you can ask me another question or we'll go, you can keep on moving the slide because I'm sure, not quite sure which sure. way you want to go. Well, I guess my, my question to you would be, is I know that there's all this effort to uh, to try to find definable uh, diagnoses codes, but how many people do you think uh, in the population, I know Dr. Afrin says maybe around 17%, are having some symptoms, some concern because of 
mast cells who may not even fall in that category that, uh, that would be diagnosable? Well, first of all, um, I kind of disagree with my good friend Larry Afrin uh, because uh, he pretty much uh, believes that every disease is due to mast cells. And even if I were to agree with him on that, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice as clinicians because it's hard enough to convince people that might have muscle activation syndrome uh, by having you know, some colleagues say that everything under the sun is due to mast cells makes the belief that muscle activation syndrome exists even harder, if you know what I'm getting uh, at. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and at least I will say that, and we might have time to talk about this, I was a keynote speaker um, uh, also in London uh, last June, or oh, one of the keynote speakers, on uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I definitely believe muscles play a role there. I definitely believe the muscles play uh, a major role in fibromyalgia. And clearly they play some role in Lyme disease, and we can talk about those. So I'd rather, as, at least myself as a clinician or muscle expert, if you wish, stick with the conditions where there's plenty of scientific and clinical evidence. Uh, and then, of course, if there is a patient who might show up where nothing else can explain uh, the, their condition, uh, I might think of mast cells. But at the end of the day, by lumping everything under mast cell category, um, I think it's very confusing. Um, I was invited and I will be the keynote speaker on September uh, 16th. Uh, at uh, Halifax, Canada, invited by the Canadian Allergy and Clinical Immunology Association. And my presentation there would be mast cell diseases. And we can kind of talk about what that might mean. Why I, do I call them diseases rather than activation or whatever you? Sure. Why don't we go out there? Why don't you talk about what you believe are the mast cell diseases? Yeah. So, you know, we all know that mast cells are involved in a number of diseases. Should we call those mast cell diseases is a question. So, for instance, allergies clearly involve mast cells. But then we have numerous patients, whether they have mast cell activation or chronic fatigue syndrome, or fibromyalgia or chemical sensitivity syndrome or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, where the mast cells are activated. So what do we call those? Obviously, we give the titles that I just mentioned, but as far as I'm concerned, they are all involving mast cell activation to some extent. And then we have the category of patients who are sensitive to various things, and sensitivity is not necessarily allergy. I have numerous patients who I suspect that might have allergies. We do a RAS test, or we skin test, and they turn out to be negative, and then we measure sensitivities uh, through different ways and that turn out to be either clinically or objectively very sensitive to practically everything. And we don't know what to call these patients. Uh, as you know, we can use the word atopy, being an atopic individual in my mind would be the one that might have propensity of having their muscles activated. But many people don't like the word atopy. So maybe we should just call them muscle diseases then allergy would be one, um, eczema would be another, asthma would be another, uh, you know, muscle activation would be another, uh, mastocytosis would be another, etc. And then we should be looking to find out to what extent, by what triggers and what is being released that might define why we actually have mast cell diseases. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, going back to this uh, letter to the editor uh, that was submitted by our colleagues that sort of dropped one of the criteria anyways, they also have a table and they say estimated muscle activation in various diseases. They don't say how they estimate it at all. And then they list that in their estimation, however they did it, muscle activation is in less than 1% of people with neurologic diseases. Yet, I just gave a lecture two weeks ago and there were 40 people uh, in the audience with mast cell activation or mastocytosis, and I asked them how many of you have any type of neurologic problems, whether it's paresthesias or headaches or depression, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody raised their hand. So hmm. this less than 1% is going to raise, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, skepticism, especially when 15 very well-known colleagues have a table 
where they say estimated and they don't say how they estimated uh, yes. you know, their, their age. So that's why I'm kind of getting upset. And maybe if one of my colleagues or many of those colleagues listen to my webinar today, they're probably going to uh, be ready to kill me. But I, <laughs> that, that's, that's how it, I think we can only solve the problems, not by you know, having estimates, by having real numbers. Um, and that doesn't fit uh, into what I and most of us actually see. Definitely doesn't fit in what Dr. Afri uh, sees. Yes, that makes a lot so, of sense. So clearly in muscle activation, we have no neoplasia whatsoever. And even the word neoplasia is very confusing because about five years ago, mastocytosis was named basically a hematologic malignancy. And a lot of patients were scared out of their minds because it was called a malignancy. But at the end of the day, it is only the muscle leukemia and sarcoma that worry us in terms of malignancy. Because as I said earlier, uh, with indolent systemic mastocytosis, with or without the CK mutation, 97% of the people have normal uh, lifespan. Um, if you go to the next slide. But before we do that, we have a couple oh, of questions please. coming in for you. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, Daniel says, can we assume that mast cell activation is involved in any inflammatory condition including autoimmune disease? Uh, I would say yes. Okay. Uh, uh, absolutely yes. I think the problem would be how do we define the muscle activation since so far, at least most of my colleagues, stick to the levels of treat days. Um, I just wrote a letter to the editor myself uh, in the New Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology for another paper that was published uh, by uh, three colleagues headed by Dr. Metcalf, who is about to retire if he hasn't retired, but he has been the director of the muscle biology section at NIH, a mm -hmm. wonderful colleague. Some of the early publications were actually uh, due to him. Um, and, you know, he's talking about the muscle involvement in other conditions and um, uh, also the muscle being triggered by many other triggers than, than allergies. And, you know, why did I write a letter to the editor? Because in about uh, 100 plus public uh, references that he has, there's not a single reference actually to my work, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of surprised the hell out of me because I also know him personally. But more importantly, um, I, I specified, which we will talk a little uh, later, uh, that we have a number of publications that uh, interleukin 33, together with either an allergen or a peptide, uh, can stimulate selective release of cytokines without degranulation. And none of those references were actually included. For instance, we published three papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, showing that AL33 together with, uh, AL <coughs> uh, with substance P uh, can induce the muscles to release interleukin-31, which, by the way, is probably more significant in, uh, in itching than even histamine. Mm -hmm. We also published also in PNAS that substance PNL33 induce massive amounts of interleukin uh, uh, 1 and tumor necrosis factor to be released, which of course are very important in inflammation. And the reason I mention this is because you mentioned would I consider mast cell activated inflammation. And now that we know that massive amounts of TNF and L1 um, uh, can be secreted, clearly that changes the whole uh, terrain. In fact, the paper on interleukin 33 uh, causing release of interleukin 1 was accepted in PNAS just today, just about three hours ago. Don't mention anything uh, more than that because there's supposed to be an embargo uh, mm -hmm. on the actual paper. Um, and when I, when I say massive amount, you know, many papers are published and they say, well, interleukin you know, such and such has increased twofold, threefold. Well, what we showed, especially for tumor necrosis factor that were published last year, so I can actually say much more about it, is if you just give substance P, let's say you get 10 picograms of TNF coming out. If you give just L33, you get about 20 picograms. If you add L33 and substance P, you get 10,000 picograms. Okay? We're not talking about the twofold. We're talking about 100 to 200 fold increase. So we've got to stop thinking that the mast cell is only involved in allergy. And in fact, if we can find ways to block the mast cells, as we will talk later, 
we can make a tremendous dent in treating inflammatory conditions as well. All hmm. right, let's go on. Yes, let me go to another question here. The, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I've been observing in my office is that there's so many people that not only do they have spring and fall allergies, but they can't tolerate heat. I mean, if the temperature just gets a little warm in the room, they start getting flushed. If it's very hot outside, they're very tired, can be tired for for days. Uh, any Correct. thoughts on what's going on there? Uh, absolutely, yes. In fact, exactly what you, you said, or whoever actually asked the question that did not tolerate heat, uh, just imagine that one of the diagnoses of mast cells being activated in my mind is one that you probably know already. But if you look at, if you see black circles under someone's eyes, unless of course they haven't slept for three days, that's a telltale sign that they have some mast cell problem. And of course, if you uh, scratch them on the uh, underarm with your nail, that's called the derriere sign or dermatographia, you get like a welt within a minute. That's yes. obviously not allergy. They're just, just the pressure on the mast cells, causing the mast cells to actually release probably histamine and other mediators. Mm -hmm. So those two alone, for me, are the first telltale signs that I'm dealing with a mast cell disease. And then, yes. you know, I will chase it down with some other uh, sort of parameters. Sure. Yeah, we do that in our office, and I'm just stunned how many people have this huge Absolutely, red line. Yes. Up. Yeah. And I would and, have thought that that alone would have been part of the diagnosis of mast cell disease, and yet it is not. Uh, yes. And clearly, it's not a it's not an allergy because we're not dealing with allergens here. It's exactly. Just a um, and no, I also people, notice in these people. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say I also some of these people report if they get bit by a mosquito mm -hmm. or some insect, they have a huge welt, a huge reaction. Correct. Correct. That is true too. Now mm -hmm. that that could be a telltale sign of potential mastocytosis, because one thing that I have to make clear is the incidence of allergies, I mean, true allergies now, the kind of allergies, you know, we all deal with, in mast cell activation patients or in mastocytosis patients, it's not higher than the general population. So that alone is telling us that in mast cell activation and mastocytosis, the mast cells are triggered by things other than allergens, which makes, of course, you know, the use of tryptase as, as a critical you know, component almost irrelevant because if the muscles don't degranulate, tryptase will not be released. Um, so going back uh, to exactly what you just mentioned, even though the incidence of allergies is about the same in mastocytosis or MCAS patients, the incidence of anaphylactic reactions to Heminoptera or, you know, mm -hmm. wasp stings is much higher. It can be as 15 times higher than the general population. So if I see someone responding to fire ant bites or to, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, mosquito bites, definitely uh, to a wasp bite, uh, wasp bite uh, then I would like to work them up for mast cell uh, mastocytosis. Uh, forget yes. the muscle activation. In other words, I would definitely do a tryptase level then. And if tryptase is higher, then I'll probably send them to a bone marrow biopsy. Mm -hmm. And they, they should have an EpiPen, um, you know, with them. Yes. Uh, going back to, not... the, to that, uh, just because I did not answer that part, you said fatigue. This is where I'm excited about the brain mast cells. Because if the brain mast cells, especially in the hypothalamus, and as I said, we have as many mast cells in the hypothalamus and then there, you know, as, uh, in, in the skin, if those basically fire, they will change our homeostasis and they could induce this feeling of fatigue. After all, unless your muscles are tired, the feeling of fatigue is like when you, we have a viral infection. It all happens in our brain, really, not in the rest of the body. So whatever molecules are fatigue producing, and we know interleukin-1, is fatigue producing. We know leukotriene before is fatigue producing. If those are released by brain mast cells in the hypothalamus, that will cause actually the sense of fatigue, in addition to other molecules. Um, so, you know, this slide obviously shows many preformed mediators, newly synthesized mediators, uh, and receptor binding, uh, you know, molecules, etc. But one thing that I want to bring up and you know, I've learned much more from patients than I've learned actually, uh, you know, from, from experiments, or at least they've led us uh, 
to do the right experiments is the lack of in, innate inhibitors. You know, in medicine, we all, always look for triggers. We hardly ever look for what might be actually inhibitors. Just think for, for a second. You know, we only have alpha-2 microglobulin. We have alpha-1 antitrypsin. What other inhibitors do we have in the body? And yet I think that there are actually inhibitors. We did one experiment that we have not published yet because we only did it in one patient, and I have had actually the funding to do it. But what we did is, you know, we take uh, umbilical cord blood and we generate normal mast cells. Uh, they take about, you know, 12 hour, uh, weeks to grow. So these are the, the, the cells that we use most of the time. Uh, and we took basically the cultured mast cells and we put them, let's say, in two separate tubes. I'm being a little simplistic here. Uh, we removed half the growth medium from each one. So let's say we had one milliliter. So now we're down to half a milliliter. And then we add it in one tube. It was more than one tube, but let's just say it was one tube. We made up the difference by adding half an ml of serum from a normal individual. In this case, it was actually uh, a young lady. And in the other tube, we added serum from a well-known, to me at least, mastocytosis patients, also female. And then we triggered the two sets of cells with the same trigger, in this case, substance B. Well, what do you know? The mast cells that had the normal serum added to them responded much less, and those that had the serum from the mastocytosis patients responded much more. So either the mastocytosis patients had additional triggers in their serum, and or they were lacking an inhibitor. Because mm -hmm. there's no other explanation why the normal serum would have actually inhibited the mast cells from firing. But we just sure. don't know what it is in the normal individual, at least in this preliminary experiment, that sure. did that. So you're, you're right. It's a balance between the triggers and the they've other. Got, they've got to be. We yes. know of some molecules that may potentially be anti-inflammatory, but they're not very good mast cell inhibitors. For instance, interleukin-10 is known to be anti-inflammatory, miserable inhibitor of mast cells, however. TGF-beta is supposed to be anti-inflammatory. Now we're doing a whole bunch of studies with interleukin-37. So going back to your question about inflammation, but also about allergic patients or mastocytosis or mast cell activation, I always try to measure to the extent possible, and if it's covered by insurance or whatever, the pro-inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory. So we we'll routinely measure interleukin-6, interleukin-1. Uh, if I can measure interleukin-33, it's not routinely measured, uh, and TNF, and then I would measure IL-10 and TGF-beta, which are routinely measured. Mm -hmm. And going back, going back to that letter to the editor that I told you I uh, submitted recently, I actually reminded Dr. Metcalf and our colleagues of a paper that he had written, a paper that I had written, and a paper written two years ago, or published two years ago by Dr. Escribano in Spain, where we all three showed independently that high interleukin-6 in mastocytosis patients tracks with severity of disease better than tryptase. We all said the same thing. So then the question would be, why are we measuring interleukin-6? Because the colleagues will say, well, it's not specific to the mast cells. And my answer is, if a patient does not have any other comorbid disease, and I measure into the six and it, it's high, that's good enough for me for diagnosis. So if, of course, they have inflammatory bowel disease, you know, interleukin-6 is likely to be released, and that kind of models, obviously, the picture. But if there's no other disease and interleukin-6 is high, there will be a telltale sign also that I'm dealing with a problem that relates to mast cells. And I think this is the approach we should be taking. And we're trying very hard to identify, actually, um, uh, other inhibitory molecules. One of my students will be defending her doctorate thesis uh, in about three weeks or so, a, a month, and she showed that chondroitin sulfate that is found in mast cell granules actually has an autocrine function and inhibits mast cells. And who knows, there might be other molecules inside the granules that upon degranulation, uh, they yak back and kind of contain um, the, the reaction. And yes. we submitted an application, we didn't get funded, 
to measure actually chondroitin sulfate both in the serum and in biopsies of cutaneous mastocytosis patients because if they lack chondroitin sulfate, there might be one reason why uh, they fire more to otherwise triggers that um, uh, should not be doing anything. Anyhow, I, gave, I gave you that's, a earful there. But. Yes, that's that's great. We have more questions coming in, but I just had a couple I was going to run by you. Sure. You know, Marty Marty Paul is you know quite famous for his uh, Ono cycle of how you know NOS becomes uncoupled and we make superoxide and peroxynitrite. Do you think it would make sense that excess peroxynitrite production might be one of the triggers for mast cells? I cl clearly uh, such molecules have been shown to trigger the mast cell. Okay. Uh, so and I'm how not about, surprised. Yeah, and but, how but, about? But uh, as you know, I apologize. As you know, these are very short-lived molecules, so it's very hard to measure them. For instance, we published two papers showing that platelet activating factor, which we usually don't talk about, and it's not actually. Uh, on the list uh, of, of this slide is very important. And we showed that uh, uh, platelet activating factor actually inhibits, I mean, I'm sorry, activates uh, mast cells. But it, it's so short lived, uh, less, less than 30 seconds. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible to measure. Yet, when we talk later about treatment, there is an antihistamine available uh, in Europe, in Canada, Latin America, but not in the United States, called Rupatadin or Rupafin. R-U-P-A-F-I-N, which is not only a very good non-sedating antihistamine, but we published two papers that it partially blocks mast cells, uh, and it is also anti-eosinophilic. So for patients that might have eosinophilic esophagitis or gastroenteritis, that would be a most important, uh, actually, uh, antihistamine to use. And as you know, many times in uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, we have eosinophils in the nose, so even there would be uh, probably quite useful. Mm -hmm. uh, I jumped ahead, but I'll return to that later. No, that's okay. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, you know when Fenton reaction occurs, and we have hydroxyl radicals when the iron combines with mm -hmm. hydrogen peroxide. Uh, what do you think of the chances that those hydroxyl radicals are also a trigger? I, I have no idea what happens with iron. Um, I, as I said, uh, anytime we have a uh, uh, free radicals, I think they will activate the mast cells. And there have been some um, some papers that reactive oxygen species actually do activate the mast cells, uh, but I don't know anything about iron. Yes. Uh, the reason, the, uh, yeah, even though I suspect it for another reason, um, uh, in sickle cell anemia, of course, you know, we have build up, as you know, and uh, some of these patients do have a lot of itching that may be related to that, uh, but no one has really looked into it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's one of the things we're researching, because again, just observing in an office, when people have a lot of the genetic issues that would lead to Fenton reaction and hydroxyl, they seem to simultaneously have all the symptoms. Now, again, that's just observing, but uh, I wonder if we're connecting some, possibly connecting some dots. Now, a couple of questions. Someone said, can you repeat the name of the antihistamine used in yes, Europe. Yes, of course, of course. It's the generic name is Rupatadine, R-U-P-A-T-A-D-I-N-E. Uh, the most uh, well-known trade name is Rupafin, R-U-P-A-F as in fire, I-N. I have a lot of colleagues uh, all over the United States who actually prescribe it to a compounding pharmacy and they compound it for patients. So mm -hmm. even though and then I have some patients who just get a prescription uh, from the United States, which is actually honored in Canada, and they ship it from Canada. Um, so, again, it's not, uh, you know, a as an antihistamine, uh, it's probably as good as, you know, cetirizine or Allegra, but it has these additional properties that make it unique in my mind. And in many of these patients, as I'm sure many of you, all of you do, you know, you try one antihistamine, you try another until you find out which one actually uh, fits best, because mm -hmm. many of the non-sedating antihistamines uh, have a, a, a paradoxical reaction. About 15% of people get wired, um, and they cannot tolerate the antihistamines at all. Hmm. Uh, but we'll talk about antihistamines later, because I've got my favorites uh, yes. in addition to, to Rupafine. Okay, a lot yeah. of questions coming in. Uh, sure. Beth O'Hara, uh, do you know anything about porphyrins probably triggering mast cells? Oh, my there's God. disruption in the heme pathway. I, I, it's, it's amazing that someone would ask that, and I'm glad whoever did, uh, did so. Um, 
I, I recently had a very, very, very complicated case I was consulting on uh, with a lot of skin reactions. Uh, and it turned out, uh, I, I just, at the end of the day, I just, I was scratching my head because this particular young man, 17 going 18, also had a lot of neuropsychiatric problems uh, that could not be uh, sort of deciphered by anybody. And I scratched my head and I said, well, could it be a porphyria? So I asked actually that they measure uh, porphyrins in the urine and they were very high. Hmm. So uh, now whether the porphyrins were inducing the mast cell in the skin or in the brain and the are causing eating neuropsychiatric problems, I don't know. I don't know of any studies, although I may be missing them, that porphyrins directly can stimulate the mast cell, but the association was very strong. And, yes. and I, could, I could easily explain why, as you know, porphyria is associated with a lot of you know, skin problems, of course, photosensitivity as well, but that's due to the porphyrins. Uh, but that's an area that I would love uh, if I had some funding to actually investigate further. Thank sure. you for your question. Well, you know what, let's take that a step further, because one of the things we're looking at at the Nutrigenic Research Institute is, do mast cells interfere with the enzymes that take the porphyrins into to heme? And then we just found an article that heme oxygenase actually is used to calm down the mast cells. So one of the things we're going to be investigating, we're actually, we're going to have a think tank in uh, Labor Day weekend. Six of us are getting together. We're going to try to think this through. You know, what's the chicken and the egg? Does the mast cells somehow impact you know the steps to heme or does the high porphyrin stimulate the mast cells or is it you know is it yes to both that they're both you know making yeah, a negative I, I feedback don't, I don't have an answer there. Uh, yeah. the one thing to keep in mind which of course can be due to other reasons uh, you know when we have um uh, or high bilirubin we do have itching uh, in most patients and i don't know what is causing it to be honest yes and uh, if i forget please remind me later uh, when we talk about treatment, uh, to uh, to talk about uh, some possibility uh, that that has nothing to do with antihistamines, hmm. uh, but since we're talking about such, let's call them more exotic uh, triggers, um, I must say if I suspect uh, someone being uh, resistant to treatment, uh, before I even look for you know mastocytosis or muscle activation, I do measure at least three peptides in the blood, all measured by laboratories like LabCorp or Quest. So hmm. one would be parathyroid hormone. We published almost 20 years ago the PTH is a major trigger of mast cells. And we see that also in uremic patients or patients that are on dialysis where they have intractable itching and PTH levels are very high in uremic patients. So let's keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more common. That's Less yeah. common is vasoactive intestinal polypeptide or VIP because we do have benign VIPomas, tumors of VIP, uh, that can cause a lot of itching as well as diarrhea, which of course is common in, in many uh, mastocytosis or muscle activation patients. And a, a, one peptide that is very confusing uh, is VIP because some colleagues in the sort of um, integrative sort of medicine uh, arena uh, want to use VIP uh, for treatment and, and I don't agree but let's leave that at the very very end because it's not as salient uh, uh, now but one molecule that I also measure a peptide is calcitonin gene related peptide CGRP because that is a major trigger of mast cells and as you know, as of a few weeks ago, now we have a CGRP receptor antagonist for treatment of migraines. And many muscle disease patients do get migraines. So PTH, VIP, and CGRP, I do measure. And if patients have a lot of edema, and I don't know what the edema is coming from, of course, it could be due to histamine, or, or it could be due to VIP being released. Uh, I will also uh, ask for bradykinin levels because bradykinin has been associated with edema, and we also have bradykinin receptor antagonist available as well. Uh, so just uh, oh, make sure that I cover the waterfront in terms of potential diagnostic, at least, uh, measurement. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Lots of questions coming in here. 
Okay. Uh, McKay Rippey, one of the uh, researchers for New Genetic Research, is mast cell degranulation a pathological state of the mast cell or is it a natural immune response? I would call the degranulation pathological, uh, mm -hmm. but I would not call necessarily a release of other mediators always pathological. Uh, for instance, uh, and I'm going to brag uh, a little bit, as a student at Yale, uh, I published uh, two papers, one in science before graduating, actually, and one in nature. Uh, in one, in the science paper, we showed for the first time that mast cells can release individual granules without ever massive degranulation. And in the nature paper, and that was 1972, 73, uh, we published that mast cells can release mediators selectively without degranulation. Since then, we have many, many, many examples. For instance, I mentioned earlier, interleukin-33, either alone or together with substance P, can release VEGF and or TNF without degranulation. Uh, there are many papers uh, now, well, many papers, maybe half a dozen, uh, showing that mycotoxins, uh, which we will talk about later, hopefully, can release uh, interleukin-6 without degranulation. Uh, there are two papers that uh, Borrelia involved in Lyme can induce uh, release of cytokines without degranulation. Mm -hmm. And I think to the extent that the mast cell uh, can be a regulatory cell, and Dr. Galli has published many papers that the mast cell can be uh, immunoregulatory cell, it can only happen by release of uh, molecules that can be immunoregulatory without degranulation. So for instance, mast cell releases interleukin-10. And we know that's anti-inflammatory. Mass releases TGF beta. We know that is anti-inflammatory, uh, even though those molecules can come from other cells uh, as well. And uh, both Dr. Galli and others have shown that the mast cell can actually present antigen to the dendritic cells. Uh, so it can act as an immunomodulatory sense in that sense. Um, so I would not be surprised if we find out that the mast cell uh, has a very important sort of not only regulatory but protective role and probably was doing that uh, millions of years ago and as we developed our immune system and that it didn't become you know kind of is not as important anymore um, but um, for instance uh, the the mast cell can, can release uh, molecules to uh, to stress, like corticotropin releasing hormone. We were the first that showed that the mast cell can be uh, induced to release uh, VGF by corticotropin releasing hormone without degranulation. And that could be both good and bad, depending which way CRH is acting. You know, if, if, uh, if the homeostasis needs to change, uh, then, then in that sense, it might be uh, beneficial. We published two papers over the last year uh, one is uh, one was in experimental dermatology called the neuroendocrinology of the mast cell. The pineal gland, the releases luteolin, is loaded with mast cells. The pituitary is also loaded with mast cells. Um, and if you think in terms of uh, genital urinary uh, physiology, the the uterus is loaded with mast cells, and we don't know what the mast cells do in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So it could well be in such endocrine organs that the mast cell regulates basically activity. And since I mentioned the pineal, three papers have been published over the last year that the mast cell secretion, not necessarily degranulation, secretion of, of cytokines, uh, has actually a diurnal rhythm. Uh, so go figure. Uh, hmm. In fact, I insist that when we do experiments, we do them always in the morning, because even though the mast cells are actually in an incubator, they have their own uh, diurnal rhythm. And if we would do the experiment in the evening, we get different results. So just like we measure cortisol at different times, I think we should start actually measuring the release of mediators uh, at different times, or at oh, least being consistent. And that's why I'm a proponent of still con measuring mediators in 24-hour urine, or at least in the first morning urine. Uh, you know, first morning you're in, presumably, you know, if you haven't actually gotten up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, you might have collection of about eight hours worth uh, of mediators that might be released. 
which might give us a better indication of what is happening than just a sport hearing. Interesting. Okay, we got lots more questions coming in here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mara, Susan Mara in uh, California, she says, do you think tryptase is a biomarker for mold allergy? No, because I've never seen a mold-exposed or allergic patient uh, where tryptase was high, yet I've seen many mediators being high. Now, if tryptase were to be high, that obviously will be a major finding. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in, and in fact, we published um, uh, the last, the June issue of a journal called Clinical Therapeutics, Clinical Therapeutics, which is online and therefore it's free, uh, was all about uh, immunity and, and, and mold and mycotoxins. And I had two papers there. One was the effect of mycotoxins on neuropsychiatric symptoms with a large section on mast cells. And then I had an editorial as well. But may I uh, please ask, why is our colleague asking that? Uh, does she, was it a she? Does she have That's actually true. evidence that three days? Well, tell you what, uh, she can either type something or uh, Susan, if you don't mind, I'll open up your microphone. While we're waiting for that response, mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Naomi. Uh, oh, she said, okay, all right. So okay. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Susan Mara. Yeah, hi, Susan. Hello, I'm just one second, Susan. There um, you go, okay, your microphone is on, Susan. Okay, so um, I do sometimes see elevated tryptase, um, and I see it with respect to um, multiple tick-borne infections, as well as the presence of any one of the four molds that are measured by real-time labs, which okay. include ochratoxin, aflatoxin, yes. trichothecene, and gliotoxin. Right. So I don't know if the tryptase, I, I don't know what's going on here. I mean, obviously these no, people- you're right, you're right. My suspicion would be that because tryptase is high, these individuals may well have mastocytosis, in which case they will be much more responsive to mycotoxins uh, on top of it. Yeah. And in, in this paper, in clinical therapeutics, uh, I have a little section on mastocytosis and mycotoxins. I am actually absolutely convinced that mycotoxins is a major problem in patients in general, whether they have mastocytosis, muscle activation, or probably if we want to go with that diagnosis, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, where by definition that syndrome is due only to toxins and potentially nothing else. Now, having said all of this, I'm also convinced that once the mast cells have become sensitive uh, or will, you know, the bar has been lowered for their activation, uh, then even small amounts of otherwise probably innocuous triggers will be triggering them. Uh, I have some patients uh, that literally, um, they say, well, I'm allergic to life. You know, I wouldn't call it, <laughs> seriously. I wouldn't call it allergic, but I would call it sensitive to yeah. to, to life. And, and in fact, I will be giving a lecture, I think in June of, I'm sorry, uh, March 2009 in the history of integrative medicine. Uh, and the title is, you know, sensitive to life, now what type of thing. Where in a sense, we're covering some of this material right now. I mean, these patients cannot tolerate literally any drug, um, you know, most foods, etc. And the, the muscles are just, just firing like crazy. Um, and uh, I, I've even had patients who were allergic to cortisone. Uh, and now there are reports about patients being allergic to cortisone. So go figure. So yeah. can I ask you really quick? Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, which is an extremely quote unquote moldy state. I mean, there's, yes. you know, yes. we're known for that. Yes. So my question to you is, um, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't see mold sensitivities in the same way um, that I see them now. That's a good and point. What I'm wondering is I live in a place that is, it is absolutely on fire with EMFs. I mean, uh -huh. it's scary. Yes. And I'm wondering if all this exposure to EMF isn't uh, like stimulating the mast cells to have a greater response 
to molds because this area has been moldy for millions of years. Yes, that's a very good point. Let me ask you, why do you think that Seattle has more of a problem with EMF than other places? Before I answer. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I just simply because we are a huge biotech hub and, um, you know, being a little bit sensitive myself, um, when I go downtown into Seattle, I almost feel like I'm vibrating. Uh, can you kindly define EMF for me? Just so that at least uh, we all uh, talk about the same thing. Electromotive force. So EMF. I know, I know, I know, I know but I, I apologize. I didn't mean to be pedantic. I know what the acronym means, but how would you define it in terms of what is it? Exposure to electromagnetic waves or what? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Well, let me let me give you this. We haven't been able to publish this for all kinds of reasons, but I'll give you a uh, We did the following experiment. Uh, how much time do we have total today anyhow? Because this, oh, we have as long as we want. We can go as long as we want to go, so no, no limits. Oh, that's, that, that's wonderful, okay. So um, we, uh, in collaboration with a colleague of mine uh, who is in the Department of Pharmacology and another colleague who is a visiting professor of electrical engineering at MIT, we did a series of experiments and I, I'm, I'm embarrassed that we haven't published them, but you know, it, it, I wasn't the first author to do this, so I'm kind of dependent on my colleagues, even though I'm, I'm bugging them every day, it seems. So we took brain slices from rats um, and I'll get to the muscles in a second. And um, uh, we, we had the slices in a petri dish, but within a box uh, that would prevent basically uh, electromagnetic waves from entering. Okay, it was shielded. And we stimulated with a micro pipette uh, by releasing acetylcholine. And we measured output, uh, let's say, of serotonin and dopamine because those could be measured um, within uh, electrochemical detector within seconds rather than release of mast cells, which might take longer, etc. So we measured literally quantum release of serotonin or dopamine, and then we just applied uh, with the output of two speaker phones from basically a computer, the equivalent of 33 millihertz, which is pretty much what a, a cell phone uh, uh, is emitting. We increased the quantum release of the biogenic means by tenfold. Okay? It was just uncanny. It was just amazing. We thought it was wrong. We kept on repeating it. And then we tried to do the same thing for mast cells, but measuring only serotonin, because that's the only thing that can be measured with <coughs> electrochemical detection. But because human mast cells don't have serotonin, we had to actually use rat mast cells, who, which surprisingly do have a lot of uh, serotonin and dopamine. And we got equivalent results. We could increase the release of just serotonin from the mast cells without the granulation by just applying that field. So I, I'm, I'm convinced that our exposure actually makes a difference, not only for the mast cells, but for diseases like chronic fatigue syndrome and autism. Um, and you know, we'll try to publish you know, this work you know, at some point. Uh, the point is, as you said, I really think that that either lowers the bar or makes the muscles more reactive, and then they, re they react to you know, a whole bunch of other things. But how do we prove that, or what do we do about it? That's a whole different ballgame. Sure, if I can just jump in. One of the persons said uh, Seattle is experimenting with 5G. They saw that as a, an issue. And up on the page here, I just showed one of the theoretical charts that we made, and you can see that the, uh, the EMF, if people particularly have the calcium voltage channel variants, uh, mm -hmm may have more stimulatory, because there are studies that EMF may jack up insulin, that may jack up the mTOR, weaken the autophagy, and then potentially setting up some tissue damage that could activate the uh, Yeah, well, the stay, stay, stay on mTOR for a second. For those of you that you don't know, mTOR uh, is mammalian target of rapamycin, is basically a downstream molecule, so after mast cells or other cells are activated, regardless of the trigger, um, the downstream uh, messages basically converge onto mTOR, and really? uh, uh, yeah, so so basically we have calcium going in, then uh, PI3 uh, phosphodiol and also 3 kinase is activated by calcium, uh, that leads down to NF-kappa B activation, 
uh, etc. But mTOR is a key place where a lot of things converge. Not as many as you have on the slide, but definitely a lot. Yes. And, and, and some, of of course, what you, some of what you have on the slide I know, some I don't know, so I don't want to necessarily talk about this slide. But sure. the two, two points I want to make. So this molecule was called mTOR because it is blocked by rapamycin, an old antibiotic. Okay. So three points. One point is that upstream from mTOR, there is another molecule called P10. P10 is the break for mTOR. So if P10 is not functioning properly, mTOR will be firing even more because there's no break for mTOR. Now, we don't know if any patient with mast cell disease has mTOR either hyperactivation or P10 deficiency. No one has done it. I'd love to do it, but no one has done it. However, in about 5 to 10% of children with autism, P10 is actually defective and the brakes mm. are not there. And they, all of those patients have not only autism, but they have mast cell related problems as well. And, and yes. I've written a couple of reviews on that. And sure. what, is, what is fascinating is that I was going to mention this a little later, but two of the, my favorite flavonoids, uh, luteolin and methoxyluteolin, actually not only block mast cell activation, and they block microglia activation by blocking mTOR. So we published one paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences two years ago, and then one paper in Journal of Pharmacology Experimental Therapeutics just a few months ago, showing that methoxyluteolin blocks actually mTOR activation and therefore blocks mast cell uh, stimulation by a number of different triggers. And mm. what was fascinating is when we measured activation of mTOR, and you, the way to measure activation of mTOR is by measuring the phosphorylation, because mTOR phosphorylates certain substrates, and we measured vessel activation of mast cells, and we measured the presence of the phosphorylate substrates. But when we inhibited by, by rapamycin, and we compare that to inhibition by luteolin or methoxyluteolin, luteolin methoxyluteolin inhibited basically mTOR better than rapamycin, which gave the name to this complex. And luteolin methoxyluteolin have absolutely no side effects, or rapamycin has so many side effects, it's hardly used by anybody. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely fascinating that luteolin actually downregulates mTOR. So, Susan, right. back to your mold, you know, if the mTOR is activated, the autophagy is weakened. So, uh, do you think that's possibly why the autophagy is being weakened by this stimulation of mTOR and therefore making us more susceptible to these molds? Are you asking me or are you asking our yeah. colleague? Oh, no, I'm, I was well, asking you. No, 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 it could well be. But the, 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 this slide could become even more complicated because yes. um, we showed, we published about five papers or so, that the mast cells, when they're activated, uh, it, it's a fascinating uh, picture. I wish I could have um, a little video to show you. I mean, I have the video, but I cannot show it to you. But when mast cells are activated, this was published in journal Allergy Clinic and Immunology in the journal. Um, so if you just go to PubMed and put my name, and um, mitochondrial DNA, you'll see the papers. Mm. But the mitochondria, we, we always known them to produce energy, which of course they do. And they're usually located around the nucleus. We showed numerous pictures with confocal microscopy that during stimulation of the mast cells, mitochondria undergo fission, they become much smaller, and they move to the cell surface. And not only they move to the cell surface, but they dump outside, without the cell dying, mitochondrial DNA. But remember, mitochondria were bacteria that became symbiotic with our cells millions of years ago, and their DNA is actually different from the genomic DNA. So when mitochondrial DNA is released outside the mast cells, is misconstrued by the body as a pathogen. So the body creates an auto-inflammatory reaction against what they think is actually a pathogen, and yet it's not. It's mitochondrial DNA. So when autophagy is actually not going on, there will be much more mitochondrial DNA released outside the cell because autophagy <laughs> destroys the mitochondrial DNA inside the cell and prevents it from being released outside where it will be actually misconstrued as a pathogen. Mm -hmm. So there are many more implications of mTOR and autophagy uh, than that we really think about. Yes, that's one of the areas that we're really focusing on, how this, uh, how this happens. And then just very 
briefly, the other thing right. that we're uh, we're looking at here is how, you know, the mast cell activation, you know, the question we have, and this is one of the questions people ask, when people have like the DAO deficiency and they have more difficulty with breaking down histamine foods, and then possibly mm -hmm. they'll they'll eat some of those histamine foods. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, do we think, triggering mast cells or just adding to the histamine load? Uh, well, both. I think primarily it is the histamine load. And I'm sure you know there is a wonderful site. It used to be called Low Histamine Chef. Now it's yes. called Healing Histamine by Yasmina. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, um, I, I, I had diagnosed her with muscle activation syndrome, and, and she acknowledges that. Uh, it's got some wonderful, wonderful recipes and other sort of ideas uh, on her site. Uh, so uh, foods like you know ripe tomatoes, ripe avocado, of course, cheese, sardines, uh, spinach, uh, nectarines, and pri most uh, spices have a lot of histamine. Some spices can also trigger mast cells, but not, not as many as the load of the, the histamine. So clearly, yes. if you suspect, you know, we should be giving diamine oxidase uh, as a supplement to many of these patients. Of course, diamine oxidase being an enzyme will not be absorbed. So whatever good it will do, and it will do some good, will be in the intestine. And if histamine, of course, then gets into the circulation from the intestine, by blocking uh, or by destroying the histamine in the intestine will potentially help with systemic symptoms uh, as well. Yes. Okay, here's uh, another question. Do you think mm -hmm. that these mast cell problems have escalated in the last 20 years? And are they more prevalent in the United States? I think they're more prevalent everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. You know, when I was at Yale as a student, hardly anybody was talking about anything other than a classic, you know, allergy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now we're like, you know, millions of people uh, yes. have it. Clearly, I don't believe, I mean, I usually say that maybe one to 2% of the population, I wouldn't go as, as high as 15% that the Larry Afrin actually says, um, although I, you know, I can stand to be corrected, but you know, even one, 2% of the population, it's a hell of a lot of people. Um, yes. So I think it's a combination of, you know, exposure to electromagnetic waves. We were never actually, you know, geared for that. Um, uh, also, a problem that I've uncovered recently, which really bothered me and really worries me, uh, many of you may already know, is uh, I'm sure you've heard of, you know, uh, shirts or, or other clothes that don't wrinkle. Mm -hmm. right? Do we know why they don't wrinkle? Does anybody know there why they don't wrinkle? I'm just curious. I don't. If somebody, if anybody does, they'll be on this, uh, on this. Uh, well, this they they lace the clothes with formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is horrible for mast cells. Gotcha. Uh, so I would stay around with uh, a clothing that doesn't wrinkle for patients that are sensitive in general. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and so that's that's one problem. Yes. Uh, what do you uh, think? So of, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What do you I'm think sorry, of the, uh, the the growth hormones that we're giving to animals? Uh, stimulating the mTOR. And I guess there's a follow-up. How much do you think stimulation of mTOR and weakening of autophagy is the cause of this severe increase that we've seen over the past 20 years? I don't know. But clearly, mm -hmm. growth factors do stimulate mTOR. Um, and uh, if you go back to the previous slide for a second. Sure. Uh, uh, no, the one before that, you had some green boxes underneath mTOR. Oh, was the next yes. slide? Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe, it was, maybe yeah. it was the subsequent slide. Yeah, here it is. This wasn't in the presentation. I just brought it in. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, no, that wasn't it. That one? Uh, this one, this one. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In this slide, and I like your slides, actually. They tend to be a little more complicated than I like, but I like them. Um, are the green boxes supposed to be inhibitory? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no question that vitamin D uh, in the journal of clinical therapeutics in, in June of 2017, meaning you know, a year ago, the, the, the most of the papers were actually about uh, the beneficial effect of vitamin D in, in immune reactions. So I always give my patients now, or at least recommend, at least 2,000 units of vitamin D3 a day. Um, now, as, as I'm sure you all know, uh, when, we, when we ask for vitamin D, most labs do not measure vitamin D3. Uh, as you know, vitamin D is pro-vitamin D in the skin, sun turns into vitamin D, then it has to go through the liver and the kidney to add two hydroxy groups. 
So literally vitamin D3 is 1,25 dihydroxy vitamin D3. So whenever I ask, I ask specifically and I write it out as 125 vitamin D3 to get that measurement. Otherwise, most labs measure vitamin D1 hydroxy group, which is a little more stable. And it is actually fairly reflective, but it's not really vitamin D3. Uh, so, uh, and then depending what the vitamin D3 turns out to be, uh, I, I will actually give as many thousand units as it might be. Now, what is interesting is uh, I see patients, a lot of patients actually in Greece and in Cyprus, and uh, even though there's a lot of sun there, about 40% of the patients I see actually have vitamin D3 deficiency. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's not the conversion of vitamin D, uh, pro-vitamin D to D, is something else happening in the liver or the kidneys uh, that doesn't generate enough vitamin D3. Now, or is it possible they're used up please. because of the mast cell activation? Mm, I don't know. That I cannot mm. tell. Yes. Now, talking about progesterone, uh, many of the female patients uh, clearly report worse symptoms either uh, before the beginning of the menstrual period or, or mid-cycle. And uh, we actually published many years ago that if you if we pretreat the mast cells with beta uh, uh, 17 estradiol, and then we trigger them either with an allergen or with substance B, uh, they secrete more. So in such patients, unless there are contraindications due to ethical or religious reasons, I will try, I will recommend that they at least try a progesterone uh, uh, birth control pill, not an estrogen. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I agree with you there. And we yeah. show the progesterone actually tends to down regulate the mast cells. Sure, I let's think I, about Yeah, I don't know about yeah. Enos. Yes, you know, we saw some papers on that. Uh, one of the things about uh, you know environmental triggers, 90% of our water supply now has xenoestrogens from plastics. Correct. So that may be I, driving I, up the estrogens. I agree. And that's a very good point that I would have come to it towards the end because all flavonoids are not good. We have about 3,000 flavonoids in nature, and some of them are isoflavonoids, which are actually estrogenic. I would never give an estrogenic, uh, uh, basically, flavonoid to anybody, uh, especially since I worry about, you know, potentially breast cancer, uh, you know, ovarian cancer, uh, uh, e even actually males who, are, you know, might actually be inducing gynecomastia and potential, uh, you know, reversible impotence by giving them uh, isoflavonoids. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that when we talk about treatment. Sure. We have quite a few questions coming in here. Uh, okay. Let's go back to Naomi Mass. She says, uh, uh, let's see, where is she here? Uh, hang on one second. I got to find it. Well, I'll ask another one, then I'll find hers. Uh, sure. Dr. Mara says, if you have females take evening primrose oil, the premenstrual symptoms decrease. So she's wondering if that might be decreasing mast cell activation. I, I like primrose oil. I don't worry about it. I don't know what it does. Um, we have actually a, a, a skin lotion that I was going to mention towards the end, but let me mention now because I want to make a point. The skin lotion is called actually Gentle Derm. You can look it up, gentlederm.com. Uh, I, I helped actually put it together. And that has actually olive seed oil. Sometimes we call it olive kernel oil or uh, olive pomace oil. So uh, thank you for bringing it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you can see there, there's aloe, uh, there is olive fruit extract, uh, chamomile oil, oregano oil, honey, and then methoxyluteolin, which is actually uh, purified from uh, artichoke. Uh, some some patients joke that they're putting actually a peach on their skin. Um, but uh, unless someone is allergic or sensitive to one of the ingredients, we tested about 200 patients with uh, absolute sensitivity that couldn't tolerate any cosmetics and then absolutely no problem. Now, I, originally I had a lot of publications on the gentlederm.com uh, site, but I took them down because I didn't want to hurt the feds uh, by indicating treatment when you cannot say that something, of course, you know, um, uh, can treat. However, right. there are publications with oregano oil uh, and with olive uh, oil that can block actually mast cells. So. The answer is I don't know about primrose oil, but I know about those two oils uh, at least. And in fact, uh, even though oregano oil could be irritating, uh, if someone is exposed to uh, to, uh, to mold or mycotoxins, 
the two things that I do, and I'm sure many of them do the same thing, uh, is I will actually uh, recommend one or two drops of oregano oil under the tongue, which is very antifungal, or I would recommend caprylic acid at about 500 milligrams uh, plus minus a day, uh, which also is antifungal, or berberine sulfate, which is both antibacterial and antifungal. I, I kind of went ahead of myself, but thank you for showing this. Sure. Uh, you might have asked, or some of the colleagues might have asked, why aren't there any creams with, uh, let's say, quercetin, which is a very popular uh, uh, flavonoid that we'll talk about later. All the flavonoids have color. They're yellow. And they're yellow because they had hydroxy groups. The more hydroxy groups you have, the more yellow actual color you have. Methoxyluteolin, so luteolin has four hydroxy groups. Methoxyluteolin has four methyl groups in place of the hydroxy groups. And because there's no hydroxy groups, there's no color. That's why we can put it into a skin lotion. Otherwise, you would have turned you know, yellow uh, hmm. if you were to use another skin lotion. Okay. Interesting. Thank okay. You. Back to the question here from uh, Naomi Mass. Mm -hmm. If someone has significant H and MT variations, that's the histamine and methyl transferase that breaks down right. histamine, uh, right. might a positive reaction to subcutaneous tuberculin injections be caused by a mast cell activation and possibly be unreliable? Hmm. I don't, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, that's um, a fascinating question. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, wh why is our colleague seeing reactions that might be four positives to tuberculin injection? Is that what? Uh, no, the maybe I'll is? have her. I'm sure she'll type something in uh, okay. and fill us in. In the meantime, okay. while I'm waiting for that, uh, Rika Keck says, wondering if evening primrose oil and mm -hmm. omega 6 could assist downshifting mast cell response by membrane stabilization. Just a thought. Okay, we have no evidence that I know of that any of these oils stabilize the membrane, uh, whether it's oregano, olive oil, primrose oil, etc. At least I have not seen any publications, but again, I don't look at all the literature all the time. Sure. Uh, even though I did say that there are reports, uh, let's put it this way, they're indirect reports. For instance, there are publications, which maybe I should put back on this side because it would be very useful in general, and, and I might actually do that, that, for instance, olive oil can reduce uh, skin reactions uh, and, and, and itching. Now, in my, in my book, that means that they're doing something to the mast cells. Yes. On the other hand, they might not be doing that to the mast cells. They might be doing it also to sensory nerve endings. For instance, chromoline, which I was going to talk towards the end, uh, or, or, or gastrochrome, or intal, if you ever remember those, those names, uh, was put into a skin lotion by a very good colleague, uh, Marcus Maurer from Charité Hospital in Berlin, and he published a study. And uh, are we still together? I hear yes. some. Oh, okay. I, I hear yeah. some uh, echo at the back. And they showed that it, it reduced itching in um, uh, uh, a topic dermatitis paper uh, uh, patients, but when they actually measure uh, histamine release by doing micro iodophoresis in the skin, there was no difference. So they concluded the chromalin was inhibiting or desensitizing sensory nerve endings, and it was not acting on the mast cells. In fact, there are many papers, including some of ours, that chromalin is miserably weak inhibitor of human mast cells, even though it's a very good inhibitor of rat mast cells, which shows us that we should not depend necessarily on animal models because they don't reflect either allergic or inflammatory reactions most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, okay, so that's as far, I don't, I don't know why. Okay, now here's another interesting uh, comment from uh, McKay Rippey. He just said he found an article, nitric oxide, a regulator of mast cell activation and mast cell mediated inflammation, Department of Pharmacology at mm -hmm. uh, the University of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, he asks, can you comment on hydrogen sulfate and carbon monoxide's relationship with mast cell activation? Boy, that's a that's a complex question. Uh, okay. Let me talk about the sulfates because that's a very interesting issue. Um, and a question comes up uh, if someone, for instance, is allergic to sulfur drugs, will they respond adversely, let's say, by taking chondroitin sulfate for arthritis? My answer is no, because the chemical bonds are very different. Now, having said that, 
we published a paper a few years back, I don't know, about seven, seven years ago. Uh, remember that there was and there still is to some extent some controversy about um, uh, thimerosal vaccines. Mm -hmm. And thy thimerosal has both uh, mercury and, and sulfated compounds as well. Uh, yes. As it turns out, if you want, I can talk a little bit about vaccines later. I don't think it's thi the thimerosal. And we did the experiment where thimerosal actually inhibited mast cells and so did sulfated uh, salicylic acid, but not acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. So it appears that some sulfated molecules, depending on the bond or the chemical bond, may be inhibiting mast cells. And after all, I said earlier that my graduate student is showing the chondroitin sulfate inhibit mast cells, and so does heparin, by the way. We, we published that and many other people published that. Of course, you wouldn't want to use heparin because of its anti-clotting you know, actions, but it was shown that heparin uh, inhibited asthma in animal models of asthma. So hmm. we might find out that sulfated compounds are very good. And by the way, um, there is a, a set of uh, sulfur springs in Greece on an island called Evia that are phenomenal about uh, uh, reducing uh, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And in fact, I had actually, uh, I participated in a sort of a workshop with patients uh, in sulfur springs up in Colorado, and they're known to help. So there's something about sulfur, but I don't know in what chemical entity uh, mm -hmm. they help. And Can I just course, jump in and say I, that... Let me just finish, uh, by, finish sure. by saying that for many children and adults, they have a lot of itching. I'm sure many of our colleagues uh, recommend uh, Epsom salts. And Epsom salts are, of course, sulfated salts uh, that you can, you, know, you can put in your bathtub and use it kind of soak in your bathtub. So something about sulfur uh, could be beneficial, but I don't know about chemical bonds. I'm sorry, yes. go ahead. No, I was just going to mention that uh, I would encourage everyone to listen to the webinar we did two weeks ago with Dr. Uh, Stephanie Senna from MIT, where she gave an interesting lecture on uh, sulfates. And one of the things that we're going to be actually researching ourselves is if the heme pathway gets disrupted, that affects SUOX, which is the sulfite, the sulfates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to what, and this is truly a question, to what degree would sulfites be an excitatory molecule that could be contributing to this, which takes us back to Stephanie's favorite subject, which is uh, glyphosate. So the question she brings up is glyphosate blocking glycine, which is the very beginning of the heme pathway responsible for the SUOX yeah. that turns the sulfites into sulfates. Uh, okay. All fascinating things we have yeah. to look at. Uh, well, two things. We, we well know that sulfites, especially red wine, can trigger mast cells and can trigger you know, migraines as well. I mean, most of the patients that, that I deal with cannot tolerate at all red wine unless, and I found out because I was traveling uh, some years back with uh, a patient with mastocytosis who was also helping me uh, at the time. And we figured out because we also, you know, we visited various places where I gave lectures uh, and so patients including Spain, and we found out that some wines, at least in Spain, and I'm sure there must be in other parts of the world, I'm not a connoisseur, are actually made in metal barrels and not wood barrels, and there were no sulfites, and she could tolerate actually wine in metal uh, barrels. So in fact, we ended up going to restaurants and asking, is there any wine that you know uh, that you might have that is not from, from uh, from wood barrels. Um, so, uh, and and there is since you know you mentioned uh, glyphosate. Uh, clearly, there are many publications, and I know our colleague from MIT uh, that show that glyphosate might be uh, or are strongly correlated with incidence of autism. But there are two papers that glyphosate actually triggers the mast cells. So that I know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, now, I was at a conference in Bari, Italy, last November. And uh, they showed actually a video of uh, of a television presentation that had been uh, done some months earlier in Italy, where they measured the content of glyphosate in about 10 of the most popular pastas in Italy. And they rate from 10 to 1,000 times more the permissible level, which has been set by Canada. So, hmm. you know, glyphosate might be in practically you know, everything we eat and it's very difficult to wash off. 
And uh, it might not be just the mast cells. Uh, you probably know there were some experiments published about, I don't know, two, three years ago, where they laced a beehive uh, with glyphosate. And within a week, the bees could not find their way back to the beehive. Uh, so, so, th so there are serious problems with glyphosate. And we were kind of, uh, you know, hoping that they might be curtailed. But as I'm sure you know, at least in the United States, we have more uh, advertisements about Roundup that I've never seen in the last 10 years. Uh, I don't yeah. understand why. And uh, mm. as you probably know, the company that makes Roundup uh, was bought by um, uh, Bayer. by Bayer, and you know it's going to be very hard to convince anybody to get you know Bayer to take glyphosate off. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's one of the things we're looking at with sulfur. Now, uh, Beth made a uh, speculation here: Could sulfur be supporting the mast cell's own production of heparin? Of course it would, but mm -hmm. but again, you know, you know, maybe heparin is released uh, when the mast cells degranulate and acts back uh, to curtail the problem and maybe mastocytosis or mast cell disease patients cannot make enough heparin chondroitin sulfate. Yes, well, and, and, uh, our, our, our good friend uh, Stephanie Seneff believes that uh, heparin sulfate and uh, cholesterol sulfate are, are critical. Uh, that's her, her theory. Now, back to the, uh, to the reaction. Uh, Naomi said uh, the patient's reaction to tuberculin was unusually large in circumference. No known uh -huh. exposure. Patient was never vaccinated for TB as they were born in France. Okay. Uh, well, I, yeah, I wonder if, I mean, are we sure that this patient did not have any muscle related problem? Because those well, individuals will respond actually with, with heightened reaction to many uh, 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 skin uh, antigens, let's call it this way. Short of yes. that, I don't know why. Yes. Well, they, she said they have the HNMT. I'd be curious if they have the uh, the ABP1 variants that makes less production of diamine oxidase. And just observing, I mean, as, as you know, we just, all we do here is, uh, you know, functional genomic uh, analysis. When people do have the ABP1s with the HNMTs, there just seems to be a very high correlation of the symptoms that goes with uh, with mast cells. Right. Okay. Uh, now here's another question from Valerie. Can you touch on hyperisophenolic syndrome and the cancer or mast cell connection? Well, I I would address those uh, as two different questions um, uh, for for a reason that I will explain. Um, uh, there are many publications that mast cells accumulate around solid tumors. And of course, we can see them around solid tumors. It will be very difficult to see them in leukemias. That's number one. Uh, number two, the mast cells around solid tumors, for reasons that we don't understand, do not degranulate. And we published two papers, three papers now, on pancreatic cancer and mast cells. One was actually in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, many years ago. So if, again, if you put my name and pancreatic cancer, it will come up. And we had some reviews on the topic. And what the cancer cells do, which is absolutely fascinating, they're smarter than all of us, they release molecules that block mast cell degranulation and release of TNF, which of course would be detrimental to the tumor, and selectively induce the mast cells to release VEGF, which of course causes neovascularization and allows the tumor uh, to feed, grow, and metastasize. Now, if I knew how the cancer cell does it, I, you know, I or anybody else will probably get a Nobel Prize on that, and we still don't understand it. As I said, we were the first to show that the muscle can release selectively, but we didn't quite know how to do it. Um, so, having said that, there's no question that the, the mast cells do participate in the cancer growth. And since then, other colleagues have written many papers uh, uh, on that. Now, I don't know enough about eosinophilia and tumors, and whether the mast cell kind of fits into that. We obviously know that whenever you have mast cells, you tend to have eosinophils, and eosinophilic cationic proteins will also trigger the mast cells. Could our colleague that asked the question maybe help me uh, understand where the evidence is about eosinophils and, mast and tumors? Sure. 
Well, Valerie, if you're willing to speak or have a microphone, uh, please let us know or just uh, just feel free to uh, type something in. And while we're waiting for that, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I think there was a... Uh, uh, oh, thank you for putting this slide up, by the way. I, oh, yes, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah in a ahead. second, I was going to talk about this. Um, yeah, go right ahead. I do, I do worry about cancers that have an inflammatory component. So as you probably know, breast cancer that has actually inflammation around the tumor has a worse predicament uh, than others, and which is an oxymoron because we would have expected that inflammation should be protective, and yet it is not. So go figure. Um, hmm. Let me say a few things. Uh, if this, can, can I say a few things about sort of the treatment approach? And then oh, I'll, sure. Oh, okay. Sure. So, uh, should we talk about uh, should we talk about uh, luteolin first? Uh, uh, well, no. Before actually, you can leave that slide up for luteolin. Uh, but okay. I would talk a little bit about before even getting to luteolin. So my my treatment approach with patients like the ones we're discussing, after sort of doing the diagnostic, you know, rubric, if I can call it a rubric, you know, looking at the peptides, looking at the uh, muscle breakdown uh, products in the urine, etc. Clearly, we'll go through whatever we have. So we'll try the antihistamines. Most of the time, combining a histamine one receptor antagonist with a histamine two receptor antagonist will give me better results. And most of the time, I will go double the dose of what might be uh, sort of recommended, uh, even though they might cause some sedation. So. Once I know that a his, an antihistamine works, uh, then I will probably, let's say, rupatadine, uh, the recommended dose is 10 milligrams. I'll probably go 20 milligrams. And in very bad itching, I might even go you know, 40 milligrams if patients will tolerate it. Same thing with um, things like Zantac. I'll probably go 150 milligrams, and I might give 150 milligrams you know, BID uh, twice a day, uh, even though it's much more than one would, would expect. So having said that, if patients continue to have symptoms, I will try uh, singular, 10 milligrams. Uh, some patients have actually nightmares with singular. So you have kind of to worry about it. I also said that about 15% of people get uh, sort of, you know, wired with the antihistamines. So we have to believe them. We just have to change the anti antihistamine. My most favorite antihistamine of all is literally hydroxyzine. Uh, or Atarax. Hardly anybody uses it. Uh, I would use it actually if anybody has uh, an acute reaction or an anaphylactic reaction. Hydroxyzine is a much better antihistamine uh, blocking basically receptors than even Benadryl, and it's less sedating than Benadryl. And not only that, but while Benadryl, every time you take it, uh, let's say at 100 milligrams a day, will sedate you. Uh, hydroxyzine, if you take it every every day, you get used to the sedation, uh, even though you still retain uh, the other properties. Uh, so, uh, and uh, as, as you know, uh, hydroxyzine is also injectable, but the injectable form sometimes have the salt palm weight, hydroxyzine palm weight, and it comes with the name Vistaril, even though, of course, it's, it's off patent. Uh, an additional benefit of hydroxyzine is it puts you in a deeper sleep than Benadryl. So uh, especially children that have enuresis uh, go into a deeper sleep and they don't actually you know, get, get up in the middle of the night. Uh, and because it has anticholinergic properties, it might keep, keep them actually from, from you know, having enuresis. Uh, in addition, hydroxyzine, it's called atarax. The French called it atarax from the Greek word atarachos, which means to calm. It's slightly anti-anxiety. So you get kind of a number of birds with one stone. Um, now, if, if the anti-leukotrienes don't work, and most of the time we use singular, uh, and if a patient has a lot of GI symptoms, I will consider chromoly or gastrochrome. However, there are two problems, at least two problems with, with gastrochrome. Less than 5% is absorbed from the gut. So most likely it will be the GI symptoms that will be reduced. And of course, if there's any histamine release, just like we spoke about diamine oxidase, uh, then, then it will actually have a systemic effect by virtue of the fact that it might block histamine release. It does not, absolutely does not, block release of cytokines and chemokines. We've published this a number of times, and so I have other colleagues. So if it does anything at all, 
you will block histamine and tryptase release maybe about 30%, no more than that. Now, two problems. The body gets used to it very quickly. We call that tachyphylaxis. So in the United States, gastrointestinal cramps comes actually in plastic tubes with a clear liquid. It's 100 milligrams per, per sort of container, if you wish. The company does not tell you how on earth they make it uh, be clear. Because if you put chromaline into either physiologic salt uh, solution or water, does not go, it doesn't even become a suspension. In Europe and in Canada and other places, uh, they sell capsules. And the idea is you open the capsule and you put it in boiling water. 90% uh, of chromaline will be gone when you put it in boiling water anyhow. So I don't understand those uh, directions. I actually had uh, a contest with my graduate students about a year ago uh, by putting chromaline into a solution. And they found out how the company does it, or at least I think how they do it, even though they don't tell you. But if you put a prop sonicator and you sonicate the suspension for about actually one minute, it becomes clear flu fluid or clear liquid or clear you know, solution and stays. So sometimes I tell patients, uh, you know, you can buy uh, a water sonicator. You know, sometimes we used to clear our instruments a long time ago or needles in, in a water sonicator. And you put it basically, uh, you know, the powder uh, in, in a uh, like you know, salt solution that you use uh, uh, for dry nose, that kind of thing, and you sonicate mm -hmm. it, you're going to get a suspension, uh, which is fairly clear. In any event, most of the time we start with 100 milligrams, meaning one such plastic tube um, twice a day. By the end of one year, most patients go to 400 milligrams four times a day. And unless the insurance company covers it, it's very expensive. Um, the, wor the, the worst part, is that about 15% of people get explosive diarrhea. It's like you know having uh, C. difficile colitis. Uh, I've had patients who lost 20 pounds within uh, one to two weeks. So you've wow. got to watch that out. And about 5% of the patients get alopecia. They lose their hair, and I don't understand why. So we just have to be cognizant of that and don't necessarily tell the patients, oh, you know, gastrochrome is excellent for you. Don't worry about it. And then you know, see them in six months, and they've lost half their weight. Um, now, having tried that, but if it works, it works. Don't get me wrong. For those patients who do get help, they do get help. So I will, I will recommend it. Now, mm -hmm. if all of that fails and a patient has a lot of itching, and of course, if they have asthma, then I will give them Zoller. Zoller is an anti-IgE. So it's a humanized antibody that neutralizes IgE. It's an injectable on its arm uh, once a month. And I would recommend it for about three to four months. Uh, and I have seen that even patients that have other symptoms or that they are not allergic or their Ig is not high, they also get benefit. And no one knows why. Uh, it might be that it, it down regulates activation of mast cells in general. It's very expensive. It's about $1,000 a month. However, most patients that I deal with, and I'm sure you deal with, have chronic itching. And chronic itching is one of the um, you know, bona fide indications, so insurance companies will cover it. Hmm. Um, so don't, don't give up before using Zoller. I found it very helpful. Okay. So now let's, let's talk about mast cells. Well, let's go back to Valerie. She came back to us with oh, her- I'm sorry, uh, with, okay. Yeah. yeah, she said, no evidence. I have simply read extensively on these associations. High eosinophils with certain types of cancer including leukemias and lymphomas. She yes. works with an oncologist and have seen correlation yes. in the clinic with a few clients, simply trying to establish root cause etiology and treatment approaches. Absolutely correct. She, at least I agree with her or those who published to the extent that we see, I, I don't see these patients, but I've heard about them, much more eosinophilia associated with leukemia and lymphoma than other solid tumors. Uh, and I don't know why. Uh, it may be that whatever is causing the production of those cells in the bone marrow is also stimulating eosinophils uh, to, to grow as well. I don't think in those cases they're mast cell related, but I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, but it would be very interesting to know if one were to use, of course, you know, in, in many, you know, cancer who use steroids and steroids block eosinophils, but as I said, rupatadine 
has anti-eosinophilic properties, and there's another antihistamine called ketotifen or ketotifen, K-E-T-O-T-I-F-E-N, also does not exist in the United States, also can be compounded. Uh, if you look at it, uh, look, look it up, you will see that it is considered to be a muscle blocker. It really is not a muscle blocker. Uh, it's as good an antihistamine as maybe hydroxyzine. Uh, I'll tell you some side effects of it. But there was two, there were two papers published uh, about 15 years ago that it could block conjunctival mast cells. And in fact, ketotifen exists in the United States for allergic conjunctivitis. Okay, we, we have two preparations. I forgot their trade names, but you can look them up. So sometimes in patients that can to not tolerate anything else, especially if they have uh, nasal problems, chronic sinusitis, etc., I might even take the nasal drops and put them into the nose uh, as a way of giving them a little bit of ketotifen if they cannot compound it. Um, now, one side effect of ketotifen is it causes a lot of fatigue, not so much grogginess, which Benadryl and Chromolin does. It's interesting, it's fatigue. And many patients cannot tolerate it. They, they feel very fatigued. I don't know why. Hmm. Just keep that in mind. Okay. Yes. So, so uh, let's talk about luteolin. Now, so we published a paper in 2000 in pharmacological reviews, uh, reviewing actually flavonoids. Uh, and it became a classic. It received about, I don't know, 5,000 citations or so. Now, flavonoids, as I said, there are about 3,000 in nature. All green plants and all flowers are flavonoids. That's why they get their colors. And all the changes in the color in the fall, at least in, in, in my part of the woods here in Massachusetts, is due to flavonoids. And flavonoids are extremely protective, and they protect the, the plants, actually, from, you know, from, from dying due to cold, uh, you know, freezing, etc. And there are many papers that are also neuroprotective. So, in general, luteolins are antioxidant. The more hydroxy groups you have, the more antioxidant you are. So, for instance, pycnogenol, which is found in grapes, has 15 hydroxy groups. Um, quercetin has uh, five, luteolin has, has four, methoxyluteolin has none. So, if you're after antioxidants, then these are very good antioxidants. However, keep in mind that about 15% of people do not have the enzymes that break down these hydroxy groups, which when they are bound to a benzene ring, they're called phenolic groups. So these patients have phenol intolerance. So these are the patients that will get very hyper when they eat chocolate, berries, uh, you know, strawberries, you know, grapes, etc. And, mm. and they lack uh, at least COMT, uh, catecholamine orthomethyltransferase, and they look to other, they miss two other enzymes that break down phenols. So please keep in mind, for those patients, uh, you know, if you give them especially high doses of any flavonoid, uh, they can really get wired. Interesting. Uh, I'll talk about the dose of flavonoids, regardless of luteolin, in a second. Now, out of all the flavonoids, some flavonoids tend to be much better than others. So, for instance, curcumin is phenolic and it's a flavonoid-like. Curcumin tends to be good as an anti-inflammatory molecule. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, GC, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, what was I about to say? I forgot now. I, I, it'll come back in a second. Uh, so, there are other, there's some isoflavones which are not estrogenic, which are actually uh, pretty good. However, there's the, the major problem with the flavonoids. One problem is that it, all flavonoids, including luteolin, don't get absorbed from the gut more than 10%. Hmm. And many colleagues, either they know that or they don't know that, and they recommend one or two gram flavonoids uh, a day. There are two problems with that. I never give either a single or a combination of flavonoids, including luteolin, more than a gram a day. Because number one, all the flavonoids, especially since they cannot get absorbed, they'll stick around in the gut and they inhibit the gut enzymes. So literally, if you give someone probiotics, you're undoing the benefit of the probiotics because you're inhibiting all the enzymes in the gut. 
So we're, we're kind of chasing our tail by giving mm. high amounts of flavonoids. In yeah. addition, if high amounts are absorbed, they will inhibit the P450 system in the gut, I'm sorry, in the, in the liver, and therefore you will not be able to break down what you should be breaking down, or you might not be breaking down molecules that should be broken down, like pro drugs. For instance, if we push two grams of any flavonoid and inhibit the P450, you will end up the kind of problems we had with cimetidine, tagamet, which many years ago were shown to inhibit P450 system, and we were getting uh, gynecomastia and reversible impotence in men. Same thing can happen with uh, two grams or more flavonoids. So please keep that in mind. Oh, interesting. Um, and especially younger uh, females, it might actually screw up, excuse the expression, their, their menstrual cycle if you push two grams a day. Mm -hmm. Now, a second problem is that the most well-known flavonoid is quercetin or rutin. Yes. All flavonoids in nature appear in a glycoside bond, meaning they have a sugar attached to it. So the glycoside of quercetin is rutin. So literally rutin and quercetin are similar, except that quercetin exists in nature as rutin, and rutin is broken down by gut enzymes into quercetin. So oh, interesting. Whether, you, whether you give rutin or quercetin is almost the same thing, except that if someone's gut is miserably uh, uh, sort of dysbiotic, they will not be able to break down rutin and they will not absorbing it, in which case quercetin will be better absorbed. I tend to, as you will see in a second, combine uh, these. How do, we inc how do we increase absorption of anything? So we showed that both quercetin and luteolin can inhibit the mast cells pretty much to every trigger uh, we had tested. And I pretty much agree with the slide that you've on, you know, roughly mm -hmm. speaking. We'll talk uh, in a second about some of the problems. Can you go back to, just to this? Uh, no, no, to, to the fiber protect for a slide. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me just tell you. Um, there are a number of things uh, that I'd like to point out to this supplement, not, be, not only because I help them, uh, sort of help develop them, but because there's some unique characteristics that you can't find anywhere else. So in this particular case, we called it Fibro Protect, although we will change this label, because uh, one of the studies we did was for fibromyalgia, and this idea was to show the trigger points in fibromyalgia, and since it occurs mostly in females, that's why we had that you know, figure there, but we will get rid of the figure next time. Mm -hmm. So I combine quercetin and luteolin because they're metabolized differently. The P450 enzymes metabolize molecules depending on how, how many hydroxyl groups you have. So since quercetin is a little more antioxidant than luteolin, I wanted to give a little more antioxidant. But by the same token, quercetin can be metabolized faster and would allow luteolin, which is a better inhibitor of mast cells, to stay around a little more. Now, do I have evidence for all of this? Well, the evidence is from the laboratory, it's not from humans. So, you know, if you were to ask me, you know, how do you decide how much luteolin and quercetin uh, to use? It's, it's, it's basically almost a gut feeling rather than, you know, real science. Sure. So you see, for instance, we have quercetin 150 milligrams there and luteolin about 255 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we increase absorption? Well, we decided to mix it up with olive kernel oil. Uh, we call it here, uh, uh, you can either call it olive kernel extract, as you can see uh, down of, uh, uh, with the superscripts, or olive kernel oil. But technically, the idea is that if you take the powders and you mix them up with any oil, in fact, we had started with primrose oil, uh, but it was very expensive and you shake it up or you sonicate it, most of the oil becomes liposomes, little spheres made of lipid, and they trap the powder inside. Those liposomes are absorbed from the gut much better than the powder because mm -hmm. they're lipid made. So by mixing them up with the olive kernel extract, we increase absorption about five times. And we showed that in animals. So therefore, such formulations that have olive oil or olive extract uh, increase the absorption much more, even though we have less amounts. So in this particular case, you've got, let's say, about 400 milligrams total rather than a gram. 
But if you were to give a gram of powder, less than 10% will be absorbed. But here, here you're giving 400 milligrams and about <clears throat> five times higher absorption, about 30% or four or 40 percent absorption without giving the high dose that will inhibit the gut enzymes and the liver enzymes that we do not want discussed earlier mm -hmm. and the patients that have fatigue and in fact most of the patients i deal with have fatigue whether it's muscle psychosis muscle activation uh, chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia um, you know lyme disease you, you know all of that and we yes. added some coenzyme q10 and carnitine which of course you can give a much bigger dose of this Independently, um, you know, sometimes in such cases there might be 500 milligrams of each going down to general quantity. In this case, obviously, I couldn't put much more because these capsules are big enough as they are. Uh, you couldn't actually, and then it will become a suppository. Usually, you can't swallow. It. So that's why yes. kind of we stayed uh, with this formulation. Now, one thing, one thing that I want to make absolutely clear, especially because we're talking, you know, to and among colleagues here. The cheaper source of quercetin, the cheaper source of routine is actually either peanut shells or fava beans. Now, what are the problems? First of all, most, if not all supplements, except for the supplements that I have developed, do not tell you either the amount or the source or the purity. So yeah. let's say let's say you have quercetin that's 80% pure, and of course, the less the purity, the cheaper it is. And I'll give you an example in a second. Let's say you have 80% you know, pure uh, quercetin or rutin from, uh, from uh, peanut shells, and you have a peanut allergic patient. You'll never know it. And you might have an anaphylactic reaction. You'll never know it because the supplements don't tell you where the source is. Gotcha. If the source is fava beans, as you remember from biochemistry, about 15 to 20% of Mediterranean extraction uh, individuals like you know, Greek, Jews, African, you know, Americans, Italians, etc., lack G6PD. In yes, fact, we find that a lot. Yeah, in Greece and in Cyprus, that's mandatory measurement in newborns. Well, if you lack G6PD and you eat anything for fava beans, you're going to get hemolytic anemia. So who's going to tell you that you're getting hemolytic anemia? And you're going to start chasing your tail because your hematocrit now is low, and mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I hate the fact that the supplements are not regulated at least to the extent that they should be saying source purity and amount. Okay? Yes. And they're not regulated. However, and here comes the punchline, if you voluntarily ask the feds to test the following, only for export, in other words, the feds cannot, the FDA cannot regulate it in the United States. But if you're going to export them, then you can ask them. And they check whether it is made in GMP, good manufacturing, a certified facility as this is, as you can see there. If you list actually the source, the purity and the amount, then they give you a certificate of free export, which says Department of Health and Human Services, FDA, it's got a huge, you know, red, uh, you know, ribbon on it, etc. And it's renewable every two years. And all of these supplements have that because I export them as well. Well, not right. I, the little company that makes them, Algonaut exports them. Right. Exactly. So for, for patients that are so sensitive to so many things, I want to avoid anything that is allergic, anything that has coloring, anything that is not pure. And that's why, you know, but, but you know, the company Algono that makes them, uh, you know, thank God for two of my old patients that became friends that supported, it's losing about $50,000 actually a year. Uh, and if it was not that they actually supported, it, it would not exist because you know they're not advertising and it's not well known and i want to finish this part at least uh, for now by saying the following luteolin is confused with lutein they are oh, yes. not the same thing and if you i just googled actually luteolin supplements six of the supplements that came up have actually lutein and yes. two of the supplements have person and they don't have luteolin at all Yes. So, what's problem number one? Lutein is a carotenoid. It's a very good antioxidant, but it's not a true flavonoid. And if you look at the structure, it's absolutely nothing to do with the structure of flavonoids. Yet a lot of your colleagues actually order lutein instead of lutein. Yes, now, we're very make, careful of telling people yeah, that. I want to make two points, because if you go to Amazon, the two products that come up, and I don't mind actually selling the products because I'm I'm very unhappy about it. 
two products will come up. One is called it's by Swanson, it's called Swanson Ultra, and it says luteolin complex 100 milligrams. I analyzed it, it has only one milligram luteolin, if at all, because I was hmm. so angry at that. Many of these companies say complex, they put the word luteolin, and they have absolutely nothing there other than being just, uh, you know, um, you know, a way to uh, attract people that now know about luteolin. Okay? Number one. Interesting. Then there's a new company that advertises like crazy now called Mirica, M-I-R-I-C-A. And they have luteolin with another oil. So basically they bypass the pattern. Instead of using olive oil, they have palmito oil, uh, oil in there, which is okay. Um, but they don't make liposomes. In any event, why am I angry? Because I opened it, and if you open it, you will see it. it's white. Luteolin is yellow. So there's absolutely no luteolin there. Even 1% luteolin would have given you a yellow color. So I don't understand why they do this. I mean, obviously, everybody wants to make money. But, you know, enough is enough. You know, at least put some decent luteolin there if you're going to sell a product rather than just, you know, pulling the rug. And they advertise it like crazy. You know, and obviously, if you pay, you know, as you know, Amazon, it comes up in the selections. So let me stop there. I gave you at least the downsides of the yes. product. But sure. if, you, if you are careful, as I'm sure you will be, you can do a lot of good to a lot of patients. All right. Absolutely. Question came in. Uh, there's a lot of articles that uh, that hop extracts maybe affected the relief of the uh, symptoms of allergic rhinitis uh, that lead to the histamine. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I apologize. What kind of extracts are these? Oh, uh, the hops extract. I, I do not know it. I've heard about it. I do not know it. Okay. Uh, now, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, again, some of the symptoms to, to wrap it up here. And one of the things that, to me, is a telltale is many of these people look like they have windburn a lot of the time. Are you observing that as well? Would you kindly? I, I've, ne I've never heard the term windburn before. Oh, uh, they're just red. Even, in, in other words, and you get hit by a lot of wind, I, you I, get I, very I, red. I, I could imagine. It's just that I don't know if their redness is any different than flashing, is any different than than redness that comes with you know itching of the skin. I, I, so I, I'm not quite sure. Is, is it okay. different or is it the same? Well, there's just some people that just look as though they like some folks when they're out in the wind and they're just they, they get this windburn right. look. And right. I just noticed there's yeah, so many right. of the people. I've, seen, that I've seen I've seen them myself. I don't know why. Uh, there could be two reasons. One could be the pressure of the wind on the skin uh, that might be activating mast cell in the skin. Uh, and it could be also uh, whatever might be in the wind. In other words, I'm just wondering whether there's also you know, pollen or other molecules in the wind that might also be causing the problem. Um, yes. Uh, you know, we also have, of course, you know, not necessarily sunburn, but I know of a lot of people that cannot tolerate not only just the heat, but the the sun, the, 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 the rays of the sun. So to speak. Very sensitive uh, to the sun, yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so it may well be the same thing. In fact, I tried very hard to find a company. If any of you know of any company, please tell me, and, and we can do it together. I uh, I really wanted to put a flavonoid inside suntan lotions for for at least two reasons. Mm. You know, the suntan lotions have primarily titanium dioxide in them, which keeps basically you know the sun from from reaching the skin. But eventually, it will reach the skin because we turn red, and then we have irritation of the skin which can lead to inflammation and sunburn. If those suntan lotions were to have a flavonoid in them, of course, it would be tremendous. Now, why they haven't? Well, for the same reason that I told you earlier, all the flavonoids are yellow, so the suntan lotions will turn you, you know, into an Indian ready to go to war uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. But with a methoxyluteolin, that could be possible, uh, except that methoxyluteolin is very difficult to purify. That's why so far we have it uh, in this particular skin lotion. Uh, uh, which is literally, it's a very hydrating and protective. If I were to put in a Santa lotion, I would put actually more methoxyluteolin in, which will be, make it very expensive. And that's, of course, a company who's willing, uh, you know, to collaborate. Uh, because, you know, the more you make, of course, the cheaper it will be. Mm -hmm. but that, that, that's something that I would love to do. 
uh, yes. if, if, if there was a company interested. Okay. Uh, Beth O'Hara says you also need retinol. She's uh, She has yes. uh, mast cell activation, and mm -hmm. she has much better sun tolerance with increasing retinol in foods and topically with rosehip oil. I, she finds it beneficial, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do too. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, I'm just speculating, but, you know, retinol is needed to make ceruloplasm, and this is truly a question. Does that help the iron behave better, therefore not make hydroxyl radicals, consequently not activate the mast cells? Again, question, uh, because we spend a lot of our time thinking about how the iron is acting as a, as a reactive oxygen species. Uh, I, I don't know. It could, it could well be. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to... Yeah, th there are a couple of papers that, um, you know, retinol inhibits actually mast cells, but I, I really don't know much about it. Um, yes. So I'll, you know, I'll, I, I've said plenty for other topics. I'll, I'll shut up on this one. Okay. Well, that's fine. Uh, just let me mention that uh, that uh, Dr. Theo Hadaris is not associated with this product and he's not endorsing it, but uh, the people who sponsor these webinars did make MC Balancer. Uh, that has uh, curcumin, boswellia, luteolin, dan, shed, quercetin, rutin, uh, and l I, 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 no, go, go back to it. I, I, the only reason I said I'm not endorsing it is because I, I have some some questions or concerns about it, and I might as well mention it because it may turn out to be just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't like the, the, the title. I don't know. I, I guess MC stands for mast, mast cells. And yes. I don't know what balancer means because I don't know what balancing the mast cells mean at all. Either we block them or we don't block them. So uh, that's like an, I don't know what it means. Okay. Uh, so let me tell you some of the concerns. First of all, as you can see, there's an amount for curcumin and for what was really added. And then it says proprietary blend. I already made a comment. I don't know what proprietary blend is. If they really have luteolin, why on earth do they just call it? You know, why do they call it 250? 40 milligrams of curcumin, and they don't say 100 milligrams, 100 milligrams of luteolin or something, okay? So hmm. we can it, find out. Since they don't say that, I'm already skeptical, which means they probably have very little luteolin there, uh, and that's why they just call it proprietary blend. So we'll Red, find out. Okay, so that's number one. Same thing about quercetin. Why do they say how much? It's so easy to measure quercetin or rutin for that matter. So I, I'd like. To See, since these are so easily measurable, why would they actually, you know, call the curcumin, you know, what it is, and that they say proprietary blend? So, for instance, for all I care, it could be 450 milligrams, you know, dungeon, and only 50 milligrams of the rest, which would be nothing. It would be, mm -hmm. you know, dust in the wind. Yes. So, in, in addition, what worries me is I don't like red sage. I've seen problems with red sage and mast cells. Uh, so therefore, I would not actually give red sage to anybody, uh, for that matter. Therefore, I, I worry, and I usually worry there's blend, because I cannot actually put my fingers on it. And these patients of ours are so sensitive that the more things of unknown quality that we add, uh, the worse actually it becomes. And let me finish by saying, it says quercetin, it says citrus, citrus bioflavonoids. Well, if it's pure quercetin, then it's not bioflavonoid. It is only quercetin. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So usually, if you if you were to give citrus citrus bioflavonoids, so citrus being in you know oranges or you know citrus whatever grapefruit, that the amount of quercetin in the pulp of the grapefruit is less than one percent. And if you were to call it bioflavonoids, that's probably less than one percent. If this is the case, then there's no quercetin there. That's why I don't I don't agree. The concept is constant. You know, if you wish co correct, but for the reason I mentioned, as a physician, I don't like it. Okay. So Fair be assessment. It. Fair assessment. Now, we want to make sure before people start leaving us that uh, people can give tax-deductible donations for your research. Uh, can you just comment on that yes. briefly? I, I, I absolutely do. Let me say that over 30 years of studying mast cells, I have never received a grant to study just the mast cells. Whatever grants I've received from NIH over the years, have been either through the skin for psoriasis or the blood for interfacial society uh, or other, and of course I studied mast cells, but because I'm not studying allergic reactions, NIA doesn't give money for anything else. They just don't believe that the mast cells are involved. 
number one. Number two, as of this July, I have zero funding for any of the work uh, that you've been hearing, even though we've had publications of PNAS, Nature Science, and uh, So, in desperation, uh, and in order for the university to help me, they created a simple site, you know, site, giving dot time, dot to produce last year, the readers, and they all have to be lower case in uh, And, you know, if anybody gives from, you know, one dollar to one million, within 10 seconds, you get uh, a response back, uh, a letter signed by the vice president, and now, why am I saying this, other than the fact that I'm desperate for funding? Because in numerous phases that I've helped uh, and I continue to help over the years without charging them, I've asked them just give some donation. Out of a thousand patients over the last three years, maybe two patients will get fifty dollars. Yet if they were to come here to see me, you know, between travel and hotel and what the university and hospital will cost, they probably pay two thousand dollars. I don't understand. Uh, number one. So number two, I'm not necessarily asking for help from all of you guys, colleagues, ladies, etc. But you know, you might have some, you know, interesting, very, you know, rich patients. You might get to donate. It's a tax deductible donation, and we'll keep us basically doing all the work that you know I, I, I think has been helpful over the years. To give you an example, uh, one patient from Silicon Valley. Three years ago, he gave 60 million, 60 million to Stanford for our allergy research. And God bless him for doing it. He gave it to Stanford because he knew some people there. But I keep on looking for the publications from Stanford, and hardly anything is coming out of ours. So where is 60 million dollars, you know, gone? Uh, so we need we need people who can think outside the box, and who can help us outside the box. I even wrote repeatedly. Uh, to the owner of, or CEO of Amazon, just in case. Uh, I've, I've written to Lady Gaga, who actually uh, stopped her European tour because of fibromyalgia. But this, these emails, of course, never get to, to them. Uh, so I'm not necessarily complaining they didn't reply. Uh, but we need, we need this kind of people uh, in order to really think outside the box and come up with, with solutions outside the box. Because yes. we were all be inundated. All my allergy colleagues who don't do integrative medicine are begging me not to send them the kind of patient that we're discussing today because their practice has collapsed because they cannot get reimbursed and many of these patients don't pay basically out of pocket. Uh, so, uh, so there we are. Yes. Now, okay. Let well. me finish, finish by saying, if any of you out there or any of your patients you really want to have some decent vacation? The patient that I see in Cyprus, Cyprus has 11 months a year sunshine. It's very cheap. It's cheaper to fly actually to Cyprus than it's, it's to fly from here to California. And there's some wonderful hotels where I see the patients. So you can fly basically uh, with about $650 round trip to Cyprus, especially in September, uh, October, and, and March and April. Uh, the hotels uh, cost about 100 euros. It's about 100 dollars a night uh, in California, and I'm not picking California. Same thing in Chicago. It's probably 250 to 350 thousand. I mean, uh, dollars a night. And for many of these patients, I have a laboratory there uh, that is associated and um, uh, certified by three European agencies. Uh, I do ask for, you know you are right there. Let's say. Uh, on day one, uh, all the testing can be done and bet by day 10, and you can enjoy some you know, very cheap and decent vacation. So think of it for yourselves to get away because we all go crazy and, and, and get you know, burned out, and we all need some vacation. So next Absolutely. time I will be in Cyprus, it will be the second week, uh, first and second week of October. So, Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Now, final well, question came yeah. from, uh, from Amy. Since yes. chamomile is related to ragweed, do people with ragweed sensitivity react to the gentle derm? Not at all. Um, as I said, out of so far, I've, you know, we've sold about 4,000 bottles. I only had two patients react. One actually reacted to the lecture I gave in New Hampshire. But this patient is well known to me and others to be literally uh, sensitive to life. I mean, she cannot tolerate anything at all. And uh, one of the, the issues that I brought up is, um, uh, and, and we've changed now, and I'll tell you why we've changed it. 
uh, with luteoli is not from chamomile anymore. Uh, it's actually from artichoke. It's both cheaper, and I avoid actually the possibility of ragweed. I'm glad you, you mentioned it. But this particular patient, when I actually uh, queried her, uh, she's uh, sensitive, and uh, actually she says she's allergic to honey, and there's a little honey there uh, in the skin lotion. Um, so uh, moving forward, uh, uh, all the, well, so all the products that have luteoli now, it's from artichoke. But in the next reiteration of this skin lotion, there will not be any chamomile extract. Uh, it will be actually uh, from, from artichoke. And I will remove also the honey, even though I said it was two people in about uh, 4,000. Yes. But, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's prudent to at least ask if someone is ragweed sensitive. Um, but in all honesty, even for people, and in Greece we have so much ragweed, uh, as, as you know, we have in the States as well. I don't know if any patient which is sensitive to ragweed cannot tolerate drinking chamomile tea. So I don't know. Um, there might be something different. Yes. Again, clear, clearly, when we talk about chamomile extra, it's not pollen. You know, I'm not dealing with pollen. It's the actual uh, plant chamomile. Uh, it has no, absolutely no pollen at all. So even the extra for chamomile has nothing to do with pollen. Yes. Well, this was absolutely fascinating. We had 80 people who stuck with us, and they're all saying thank, thank you, so you for uh, for your time. Uh, you gave us so much time here at uh, uh, two hours and uh, 20 minutes, which is a record for our webinars. We probably could have gone longer, but I'm sure uh, it's been long enough for many of the people to here. So, so thankful for you coming. I know you're so busy. As a thank side you very note, much. Yeah, we met in uh, in Poland. We were both right. speaking at the uh, at the uh, ILADS uh, conference. We both had a uh, a great time uh, chatting a little bit. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Theo Hardys, thank you so much, and uh, hopefully maybe you can even come back someday and give us another update. Uh, give me about a year. Uh, I think we'll have a, a lot of new findings. Um, okay. By the, by the way, uh, I don't know if it was anywhere on your slide presentation, but my website is all one word, must sell master dot com so must sell just like must sell and master it's a little corny name but i've had it for many 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 years uh, you can find and download for free literally all our publications in pdf uh, format um, uh, you can also uh, see a number of uh, presentations that might not uh, be uh, easy to find maybe on the web uh, and i usually put all my slides after my lectures uh, with maybe a you know, two, three weeks delay. But mm -hmm. let me finish by saying uh, I, I take some pride uh, in the fact that uh, three years ago we created a, a documentary while I was actually lecturing in Copenhagen with two patients, one with muscle activation and the other with muscle psychosis, the first lady from Copenhagen, the other from Michigan, actually. And it, you can look it up on the YouTube, My Mystery Symptoms and Mask Cells. So I cover quite a bit of what we discussed um, here today with some slides and a lot of, of course, comments from the actual patient. Uh, it's, a, it's a little long. It's about a, a 50 minutes long. Uh, but uh, it's interesting when we, uh, it was created on the spot. Because mm -hmm. I'm so I'm a, I'm about 500 emails behind replying, and at that time, because I was going to have a I shifted through to see if any patient was from Copenhagen, and in fact she was, and uh, she had her own uh, uh, TV program, and we decided on the spot to just uh, make this documentary. So my mystery symptoms and mass cells. Interesting. You... Someone's asking to repeat your mass cell website, please. Yes, I. Uh, it's uh, M-A-S-T-C-E-L-L-M-A-S-T-E-R, all one word. So mustsellmaster.com. Yes. Well, again, Dr. Theodaris, thank you so much. We are so grateful for you uh, for coming, giving so, uh, so graciously, and uh, people are just saying thank you one after another. They're saying thank you, thank uh, excellent. Thank you, thank you myself. Uh, yes. Please send me, please send me the link when it's all done. Oh yes, of I, I put the link also on my website under the links. 
uh, if that's okay, and then other people will come go and visit, of course. Yes. Okay. Well, we had okay. a record attendance tonight, and uh, again, many, many thanks. Have a uh, good night. I'm sorry I was speaking fast, but if I, if, I, if I were speaking slower, it would have taken probably three hours. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thank you all again, right. everyone. Take care. And we'll sure. talk to you all again soon. Have a great okay. evening, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you good again, night. Doctor. Good night.